Hi, Foster. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. I can't hear you. Hold on and see what's wrong. All right. Say something. Yes. Say something. Yeah, I was trying to use my microphone as my output. <laughs> okay. Good. Cool. It looks like we're on. Excellent. I'm going to get my other machine if, if I can get the link over there. Mm -hmm. So is this the machine that you're going to be presenting from? The second one will be. The other one? Okay, so I'm not making you co-host then. Hi, Ali. Hi, Ali. Hey. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Very early in California, huh? Yeah. Well, I just came from Europe, right? So I'm, it's not too bad for me. Oh, you're still jet lag? Exactly. Yeah. Can't imagine that. So I'll make you a co host. Just see my other one now? Uh... Yeah, we see you in, on to, two screens now. Yeah, I'm gonna... That's pretty cool. <laughs> With different names, just to make it extra confusing. <laughs> what's the, what's this, this one has me, what's the other one have? Hannah. Oh, Hannah, there she is. All right, yeah. I'll have to figure out how to change that and I'll get off the, I'll take the turn. Okay. So I've done this before, so there shouldn't be, normally there's all manner of audio problems when I do this, but I think I've got it, I think I've got it down. I'll share my slides. Do you guys see my slides? Yes. We do. I may stay, I may remain Hannah because I can't on this machine figure out how she changed my name to hers whenever she did it last. That's my daughter. She must have done a meeting for school using this machine. Yeah. That's okay. I think that you don't really have to to change. Yeah, you can say you'll know you know which one's which. <laughs> exactly. So, do you want me to make Hannah, Hannah a co-host? Hannah the co-host. Yeah. Which I think you did already, right? No, you have not. I have not. Uh, depends on. Let me try to do that. I can't. Maybe I need, I need to stop sharing. Yeah, if I stop sharing, then I, I have that access. So I guess we'll wait for another minute or two. Sounds good. I think we could probably wait five minutes just because people are going to be having issues with getting their. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. Technology set up. Hi, everybody.
We're going to wait some time just to, for people to get everything set up and logged in. Yeah, that's the first time we're doing that, huh? Did I miss anything? Anything new happened over the last uh, 30 seconds? Nothing. Looks like uh, all, all good. Yeah, for everyone on the Zoom, we are waiting for another couple of minutes for people to join, and then we'll start. So I guess it's uh, time to start, right? Yeah, let's go. Um, yeah, let's go. <laughs> this session is recorded, so the, the recording is going to be accessible. So welcome everyone to our tutorial about data science for real estate. Um, the goals of this tutorial is uh, to introduce real estate to data scientists essentially. Real estate is a fascinating industry. There are very many interesting data science problems that are currently not really being addressed by data scientists in real estate because there are not that many data scientists who work in real estate actually. And we want to change it and that, that's why we were giving that tutorial. The presenters today is, uh, I'm Ron Beckerman, the CTO of Cherry. 
Cherry is a real estate data aggregation platform. Uh, with me is uh, Foster Prova, who doesn't really need to be introduced, is a full professor at the university, New York University, um, is really well known and very active in the data mining community, gave many invited talks and uh, have many best papers awards and he sold his startup to a big um, brokerage uh, called Compass, and now he is a distinguished scientist in Compass. And uh, we have two more people from Airbnb, Ali Rao, who is the senior data science manager at Airbnb. She is a, an econometrist, econometrist uh, by training, and um, she is managing a big real uh, real estate data science team at Airbnb, and we'll hear her later on. And Vanya Yusifovsky, who is the CTO of uh, Homes at Airbnb, and before that he was the CTO of uh, Pinterest, and before that he built a very successful um, industrial research career. Um, the outline of our uh, tutorial today is we're kind of splitting the first portion to three parts. I'll start with introduce, introduction to real estate, and then I'll focus to, into commercial real estate, something that I'm quite familiar with. Then we'll let Foster talk about residential real estate, and Ali talk about short-term residential, which is what Airbnb is uh, focused on. And we'll have a short break, or probably not that short. And in the second part of the tutorial, we will have a, a fireside chat. So the four of us will be just discussing the new frontiers of data science and real estate. And so we'll spend like about, um, an hour together when I'm going to be presenting. So like I'll, we have to kind of introduce myself. We usually when someone is giving a KDD tutorial, they just dive into the, the um, you know, technical material and no one really knows who the presenter is. I, I don't want to be that presenter. So a little bit about myself. I'm definitely not a novice at KDD. I Pre presented my first paper in 2000, first KDD paper in 2009 and gave my first uh, KDD tutorial in 2011. I worked uh, as a data scientist at LinkedIn back then and we were about to publish the book about scaling up machine learning, so that was my tutorial. Um, in 2013, Foster organized a, a panel about how to make money from data science and I, back then I was the chief data officer of a big uh, venture capital fund. So I was a panelist on that panel, um, co-hosted KDD Cup for a couple of years, was uh, the KDD uh, social networking co-chair for three years. Here's uh, Faisal and me are doing some stand up at the opening ceremony of KDD. Uh, that was pretty embarrassing, I would say, but fun. I have a best uh, reviewer um, award, and overall, over many years, I've read and reviewed really, really many uh, KDD papers, and I can say that I have never seen pretty much any KDD material that is related to real estate, and this is something that we really want to change. So I'll start saying that uh, real estate is really big. So like arguably this is the uh, biggest asset class in like, you know, all the financial sector. Um, no one really knows what the size of the real estate in the US is, even not talking about the world, but the number that people are kind of agreeing on that it's uh, something in order of magnitude of a hundred trillion dollars so it is a really big industry, and the industry is also really old. After all, like, you know, people needed a roof above their heads for hundreds of thousands of years, 
and the real estate industry as it, it was shaped like about 2000 years ago didn't really change that dramatically uh, which is kind of really unusual and uh, strange to think about but what ha is happening over the last uh, half a year is totally shaking this industry so uh, you know people are talking about the de death of uh, office space people start moving out of cities like before they were moving into the cities because they wanted to live next to their work and to commute less and now it's the opposite so the industry is changing really dramatically and uh, it creates an, an enormous opportunity when the industry is so large and the change is so sudden uh, we definitely can see many interesting uh, trends that are are being created and many other trends that are being broken and that's why it's uh, really important to work in this industry right now so what is the real estate industry after all so i'll split this industry like you know the slide of the industry map to quadrants uh, first we have residential real estate and commercial real estate so residential and commercial the difference is that in residential real estate uh, the owner is the individual and in commercial real estate, the owner is the commercial organization, uh, sometimes a very large organization, sometimes a pretty small one. Uh, and uh, horizontally, we split the domain to owner-occupied, long-term rentals, and short-term rentals. Let's focus in every quadrant and see what we have here. So residential and owner-occupied is just a single-family home in many cases. It's a house that is being owned by the person who lives in this house. It's a very, very big industry, obviously, because there are many single family homes in, in, uh, in America and other countries as well. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, owner occupied is usually a big organization that needs to have a, an office space that, you know, where the organization resides, where, where the headquarters is. And uh, uh, say like uh, McDonald's owns pretty much uh, all the real estate of uh, their branches. Um, this real estate is not for investment. They're not trying to make money out of it. On the other side, since they're holding this real estate and this real estate can go up in the price later on, so it's usually profitable to have this real estate. But uh, what's even more interesting uh, for me, at least, is uh, uh, the investment market. When people have real estate in order to make uh, income out of it. So in residential long-term rental, it means that it's a person who owns a house and lives in the house and owns another house and rents this house out. So it's a very small operation, individually owned, uh, usually, uh, you don't have to have a big uh, organization behind it. And uh, if person happens to buy more and more real estate, it becomes already a commercial organization and it's bec becoming more complex. On the commercial side of the long-term uh, rental, there are many subsectors and the most important is multifamily. Here's a little bit of a confusion. Multifamily is a place where people live, right? M many families live in the same building. So why is it commercial and not residential? Because it's usually owned by a commercial organization and it's a quite, quite an operation to maintain this property. Uh, and uh, that's why it's, it's still considered commercial despite the fact that people live there. And the other three sectors are not uh, small either, but probably less uh, of a confusion, office space, retail space, and industrial space. Industrial space is very interesting nowadays. I'll talk about that very little because uh, I don't have much to say, but like, you know, if someone wants to focus uh, uh, on real estate, commercial real estate, the industrial space is very interesting. Uh, now, the short-term rentals uh, in the left side, 
in the residential market, we have this rental market space that Airbnb created before there was no quadrant like that at all. And so Airbnb kind of owns this side of the market. And in the commercial space, it's usually hotels. And very fairly recently, we started talking about co-working spaces. Uh, we're not going to be touching that much on, on that quadrant uh, uh, for, uh, for, the, for this specific tutorial. And there are two big chunks of the market that is like cross uh, sectors. One is brokerages. Brokerages are organizations that help you to sell, to buy, to rent, uh, and they are totally cross, cross market. And another section is uh, technology. That's where we are, and uh, it's also cross market. The technology is helping pretty much everything, uh, but uh, so far it's not really widely spread. So PropTech is, is not a very big um, a high tech industry. I'll be talking about mostly uh, commercial real estate. Uh, uh, after this introduction, I'll focus mostly on the commercial side. Then Foster will be talking about uh, um, residential and Ali will focus on the rental market space of uh, Airbnb. So just probably one uh, uh, like, you know, um, side note. Uh, the market is obviously measured by the number of property and the size uh, and the price of the property. So the long tail here is residential. Properties are not really expensive, but there are very, very many of them. There are about 150 million uh, properties in the States, and I'm talking about United States only. But uh, the head of this distribution is the commercial market but the, where the prices are really large. We can talk about like, you know, it, a billion dollar property. Uh, but uh, obviously there are not that many properties like that. It's, uh, it, the saying is that it's about something like 15% of the properties. But the size of the market in terms of the price is about uh, uh, one third. So one third is a commercial real estate and two thirds is a residential. It's a very interesting um, slice here, which is the mid market between commercial and residential. Those are uh, properties that some of them are commercial, some of them are residential. This is a very interesting slice that mm, are, is not really being uh, researched properly and uh, uh, again, someone wants to focus on real estate, that might be a very interesting sub-market to, uh, to work on. So from now I'll focus on commercial real estate, meaning that those are organizations that uh, invest in real estate in order to get some income from leases. Uh, you can assume that, like, you know, imagine that you're working, you are a data scientist working for a, a big investor like that. And there are really many interesting really, uh, data science problems that need to be tackled. So I'll start uh, saying that uh, the real estate investment market is uh, kind of not really up to date. Let's put it like that. First of all, it's very local, meaning that uh, in real estate investors, like buy properties in the very short vicinity from each other. Some of them invest in just one single street in, in a big city, like, you know, in own 10 buildings in a, a very like landmark important buildings in the city. And you can have a portfolio that is like, you know, a billion dollar portfolio. Uh, why is it local? It, it's because the investors know this area. They've been, you know, analyzing it and working with it for decades. So they know really well what they're doing. And that's also the reason why this market is not liquid enough. So the moment an investor buys, uh, acquires a property, they just usually hold on that property. Even if the property is not doing really well uh, financially, it's very hard for to get rid of it because of 
they already know what's going on. If we, they want to go to a different, like, you know, part of the city, I'm not even talking about a different city, it's a completely uncharted territory for them. They just don't know what's going on. So the lack of knowledge is actually like the driving force of the real estate industry, which is kind of really counterintuitive, right? You need, in order to invest, you actually need to know a lot of information. You need to know what's going on with uh, sales prices and leases and management costs and taxes and uh, other features and transportation. And, like, all this you need to know in order to decide whether you want to invest like, you know, um, hundred million dollars in buying this specific property. And all this data needs to be all together in one place, which is not what's going on right now. So let me kind of dig into some of those features that are important for a, an investment decision. Uh, here's a picture of the, of, uh, the building where Cherry's offices are. And uh, first we can like look at the neighborhood features, say transportation. It's really good from the, the transportation point of view, but uh, it's not a very nice part of the city. So the crime rate is, is fairly high. In terms of lunches, yes, like, you know, restaurants are all around, no problem. So, like, this is a, if, a, an interesting investment opportunity if you wanted to ever to buy this building. So, the neighborhood features are known. You don't need to dig really deeply to get this information. On the other hand, once we're talking about the building features itself, I mean structural features, that's less obvious. So some of them are obvious, right? So this building has two facades, which is, uh, say, it's increasing the management cost and insurance cost. So like it, it, it has its disadvantages, but on the other hand, the building is much more visible because it's a corner building. The number of elevators is important. Like two elevators means that it's gonna be a congestion when people wanna come to the office in the morning four elevators, meaning that it's good. Um, and this building, as you can see, is mixed use. So you have a retail on the bottom, services uh, right above it, office spaces in the middle, and some executive suites on the top. Uh, so once you decide to invest in this building, you need to know that, that there are actually like, you know, four buildings mixed together here in one building, and you need to take those sectors separately and see how well they are doing. And this is the most important part, like when you need to invest, when you think about investing in real estate, you need to know how is this building doing? Like, is it actually profitable? Is it, uh, uh, and the questions are related to the lease contract. So how many occupants or tenants you have in this building? Um, maybe the building is half empty. Uh, what are the, uh, lease uh, like duration and rate and all this is very important to know unfortunately if you if you don't decide to invest in this building this information is really not publicly available so it's very hard to get this information if you decided to invest in it the owner will provide all this information for you so you can make a, a smart decision but you first need to kind of you know get really interested in this building and now, which is even more complex, obviously the price of uh, uh, the price and like you know your decision about investing in real estate depends on what's going on around this building. So on the left is the same building, and on uh, in the middle and the right is uh, those bu buildings that are adjacent to to the one that we're considering, and like something is going on there, right? Like the, the like narrow stripe in the middle is actually a hotel. Do you know how well this hotel is, is doing? No idea. Do you care if you wanna acquire this uh, office building next door? Yes, you actually do. Who would provide this information for you how well this hotel is doing? No one. So out of the sudden, like, you know, you need to make a very difficult decision. Invest like a hundred million dollars in an office building you don't have a full visibility to what's going on. So you kind of have a chicken and egg problem. Like you really need to be interested in investing in a specific property 
in order to get all this information about the property and probably information about what's going on around it. But how can you be interested if you don't know? This is the biggest trouble. The market is actually kind of managing to solve this problem partially. What they're saying is that, yes, you don't have a full visibility yet, but we can talk about one factor that is called a cap rate that is actually giving you in, like a feeling, a notion of uh, uh, whether this investment might be kind of worthy, in a, worthy okay. or not. So a cap rate is a very simple formula. You take the uh, yearly income minus the, the yearly costs and you divide by the size as, as uh, the price of the property. That is like an invert of how many years it will take you to get your money back. You invested like $100 million, you want to eventually get it back, right? And you probably want to get some more money after that. So like this is the, the number of years. So like if the cap rate is something like 3%, that essentially means that it would take you 33 years to get your money back. And if the cap rate is 10%, then you'll get your money back within 10 years. And that's more or less the, uh, the range of the cap rate. Cap rate is like, it's, um, people who know cap rates are very rich because uh, it's not really easy to figure out the actual cap rate. And real estate investors are talking like, you know, of cap rates in terms of like, I've seen a building that is an eight. That essentially means like it has a cap rate of eight percent, which means that it's like a really, really worthy investment, but it's also a risky one because uh, the higher the cap rate is, obviously the higher the risk is. Like, you know, no one would uh, pay very high rent in a building that is fairly cheap unless there is a reason for that. So, uh, Overall, the real est uh, commercial real estate is all about cap rates, and it's very important to know the cap rates, and not many people actually know the cap rates. We, as data scientists, can actually estimate cap rates. So the formula is very easy, right? So like you need to take uh, uh, leases and costs, which is taxes and management costs, and the sales price, you have the cap rate. That's so easy. The good news is taxes and sales prices are publicly available in the States, not in every country, but in the US they are. And there are companies that can provide you with lease information and uh, maintenance cost information. So it is technically possible to compute or estimate the cap rate. Obviously, you will have a lot of missing data, but we are data scientists. We, we can deal with missing data. Uh, the bad news is that even if you have all this data, to join it together would be very difficult because lease data comes per unit, maintenance cost data comes per building, and taxes and sales data is coming per lot. And now we need to make sure we understand what those terms mean. So a lot or parcel, it depends on a specific market, uh, is this real estate, this property that you can buy, you can sell, and it's being taxed. So in a residential real estate, it's usually a piece of land on which you have the building. So the piece of land and the building together is a law. So uh, a building can be split to units, obviously, in some cases, um, it's still one lot despite the fact that it's split to units. So you need to buy this lot and rent all the units separately. In some cases, you might have multiple buildings on a lot. In some cases, a, a, a one building can be split to multiple lots. So each unit is a lot. So this is creating a lot of confusion. Uh, even if you have access to the data, like you know, joining it together and figuring out what the cap rate is, it's very difficult because of that. But um, uh, we're kind of lucky. All of them, lots and buildings and units have addresses. So 
probably instead of joining on lots and buildings and units, we can add uh, join on address. Yeah, it would have been easy, but it's not, unfortunately. So addresses are not normalized in, in, in the data, real estate data. So all these uh, are the same address of the same building, and we need to build a normalization system to figure out that that's, all this is, is just one single building. So let's say that we even can build a normalization system. It's still not trivial because uh, you have a notion of uh, alternative addresses. So say 401 7th Avenue and 403 7th Avenue. Are those two separate buildings or the same? Yes, it's the same building because in the US, the house number uh, has a range. And if the house number, if two numbers are within this range, it's the same building. Some uh, street num names have aliases. So 7th Avenue and Fashion Avenue is actually the same. And here are two more addresses and you're looking at that that are like, well, those are definitely unrelated addresses, right? No, unfortunately they are related. If a building is a corner building, in many cases it has, it has an address of an avenue and an address of uh, a street. So all these are addresses of the same property and uh, like visually it's not recognizable. You need to build a, an address standardization system to actually figure these things out. And uh, that's what the data scientists and real estate uh, focus uh, at least uh, in some cases. Okay, let's say that we managed to join the input data and estimate cap rates. Now we know that like, you know, this is the area where the cap rates are high enough, which means that we are interested in this specific area we want to invest. And now whom should we talk to? So it looks like that's a simple question, right? Like we should talk to whoever is selling. Well, in commercial real estate, it's not really the case because if someone is selling, a, say, an office building and the building is on the market for quite a while, that essentially means that something is wrong with that building. In many cases, a commercial real estate investor would just acquire the building and hold on it. That, like, you know, it's a rare case when someone wants to sell it or something something bad is happening. So if you really want to buy a, a good building that nothing is really happening with, you need to create the deal flow. Like you need to find out who the owner is and contact the owner with, with a particular offer. So the question is, whom should you contact? <sighs> Turns out that is not easy in real estate either. So buildings are owned by tiny companies, tiny LLCs that are absolutely obscure. So like um, say the uh, Chrysler building is owned by 405 Lexington and no one really knows what this company is. There is a large and well-known company behind this LLC, but on the papers, the owner is this small LLC. No one knows what this LLC is all about and we need to figure out who is actually behind those tiny uh, masking entities, companies that are being used to mask the real owner from the, the market. So this is not an, a, a difficult, uh, not an easy task at all. And to solve it, we need to build a knowledge graph. And actually at Cherry, we have built a knowledge graph that contains properties and addresses and people and companies and other organizations all connected together based on the actions that they, they have been making. Currently we have about half a billion nodes and about one and, one and a half billion edges in the graph and it covers the entire US market. So all the properties uh, that are in the United States uh, commercial or residential are in this graph. So it's very important to build a comprehensive knowledge graph that covers 
all the markets because all of them are very connected to each other. So like you cannot build a knowledge graph for commercial real estate and not take into account the residential part at all. This is not gonna work. So obviously, I guess you guys are familiar with knowledge graphs. The knowledge graph has the topicality, the topical locality feature, which means that things that are related to each other will be close to each other in the graph. And they're organized in like what we, what we call semantic neighborhoods. Like we need to separate like, you know, geographic neighborhoods and real estate, semantic neighborhoods and the graph, which means that those are nodes that are close to each other and they're connected to each other. And if we traverse, traverse the, the knowledge graph, we actually can reveal hidden relationships and that's where we're heading. Here's an example, a small portion of that knowledge graph. On the far uh, left, we have a real well-known uh, real estate investor called Donald Trump. And uh, uh, Donald Trump is connected to people and companies and properties. Those companies are connected to addresses and other companies and other people. And the relationship between Donald Trump and the person called Paul Davis is, uh, can be revealed using uh, the, the traversal of the knowledge graph. And this is not a trivial relationship. If we were to say Google that, those two names, Don Lamp and Paul Davis, you will just find a different Paul Davis, not the one that, that we're talking about uh, here. So this, how we can use the knowledge graph and throughout this, uh, part, of this part of my, the tutorial, I'll talk about the knowledge graph quite a lot. So we use the knowledge graph to do owner unmasking. Start with the property and traverse the graph until you reach uh, some type of a real well-known real estate investor, which is also a node in the graph. And that is most probably the owner behind this specific uh, property. Uh, two um, uh, comments about knowledge graphs. Uh, usually knowledge graphs are open-ended, meaning that like, you know, if we didn't find the relationship into nodes, maybe it exists, but we haven't found it. In real estate, the knowledge graph is actually a closed world, meaning that if, say, Silverstein Properties is not connected to Trump Tower, that essentially means that they just don't have anything to do together. So this is a very uh, interesting and important feature to use. We can assume that uh, the knowledge graph is kind of modeling the real estate ecosystem as is and if there are no connection between, uh, connections between two nodes, that essentially would mean there is nothing that is in common between them. Many real-world graphs are scale-free, and that makes uh, uh, a data scientist life difficult because there are those bridge nodes that connect completely unrelated parts of the graph. And the good news is that the real estate uh, knowledge graph is not scale-free. Because if you think about it, there is some type of a geographic grounding to the knowledge graph that is being built because those are properties and people who invest in those properties, they have this local characteristics of the geography that they are working in. And that's why the, the graph is uh, not scale free, which is a good news. Like when we're talking about semantic neighborhoods, which don't have bridge nodes, we actually can really well model what's going on in this specific locality. The trouble is to build a knowledge graph, obviously, and because like, you know, you need to create nodes for entities and the names of those entities are not normalized. Uh, here on the left side, you have the same person. On the right side, you have the same address, but the graph is completely disconnected. In the real world, it's even worse because it is actually connected, but connected kind of very sparsely. When you look at that graph, you're like, huh, that's a good graph. Since the graph is so large, it's very hard to figure out that the graph is actually pretty garbage. And a lot of work needs to be done to connect all these nodes on the left together and all these nodes on the right together as well. There are very many ways to write the same name of the same person. Um, here's Aaron Ziegelman, uh, quite a real estate hero. 
Uh, he used to own a lot of real estate in the 80s uh, in New York. And uh, there are very many ways to make a typo in this guy's name. 25,000, what is this number? That's the number of ways to write the name of JP Morgan Chase Bank. So we found 25,000 different ways to write the name of that bank. That would include all the subsidiaries, all the branches, all the typos, everything, wherever you can make a mistake, someone will definitely make a mistake. Um, so, uh, as you can see, it's uh, like cleaning the data is a very important part of this, uh, the work in uh, every data scientist essentially, but in commercial real estate especially. I'll give you a few examples. I'll try to be quick here say those two names we taught the system already that it's the name of the Morgan, uh, JP Morgan Chase Bank, despite the fact that they have absolutely nothing in common, we know that it's the same organization. But talk, what about this name? That looks like a person whose first name is Chase, last name is Morgan, and the middle initial is N. Probably that's not a bank, right? But what if you're looking at something like that? NA is actually a very good indicator that it's a bank. And so on the right side, it looks like it's more like a bank. And then you're looking at the left side, you're like, huh, that looks like a bank too. That's probably not a person. Here's another uh, problem. Like Tishman Spire is a really well-known real estate investor. And the name is very unique. So whatever indicator words like LLC or Corp you add to the end, to of Tishman Spire, it's still gonna be the same Tishman Spire. But what if you take a very generic name of uh, a typical uh, a company that owns just one property, say one three Main Street. If it's LLC or Corp, is it the same company or not? Probably not. What if, uh, if the indicator word is company or say co, right? Co can be corp or company, so it's becoming really ambiguous. So you have no idea what it's referring to. Here's another example. Meryl Streep, you write it in any order of words, it's still gonna be the same person, right? What about David King? If you write the David King's name as a, in, in a different order, you end up with King David, and that looks more like a hotel or more maybe a restaurant. It's already not a person just because the uh, order of words is different. Here I, I just came up with some type of a very rare last name and the first name is John. So on the right, on the left, it's probably the same person, right? Despite the fact that on, on the right it's written with a typo. But what about the, if the name is Joan? That's a female name, right? So it's just one uh, character of a distance. The string distance is one. But those are probably different people. And what if it's Joanne? Uh, you know, like uh, um, maybe since both of those are female last name, uh, so first names, maybe this is the same person actually. And the last example is uh, the decision about how to normalize the data can be very cultural. So I happen to be a Hebrew speaker and I know that the name on the bottom left is an organization and the name of the bottom right is a person. But I just happen to be a Hebrew speaker. I don't speak Chinese, I don't speak Spanish, and like I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure that problems like that have been in, in other languages as well. So it's a very difficult task to normalize this data, to build a knowledge graph, but once the knowledge graph is built, we can apply owner and masking and we can find out who the owners of properties are. So let's say that we are commercial real estate investors. We decided that we want to invest in a specific property and we know whom to talk to because we use donor unmasking. Now, what about the price? It's kind of an existential question, right? Like, you, uh, what is the price at all? So in some cases, especially in residential real estate, it's, it's not really hard. If those two buildings were sold for 200K, what's the price of the building in the middle, right? I think it's a fairly simple 
uh, answer, right? But what if you have a big city and it's very diverse, obviously. There is a building that costs 200 million or a building that costs 20 million. And what is the price for Chrysler building if you have this information? It's very hard to figure out, probably, like I would say, completely impossible. So the price is a big, big trouble. And there are really many valuation models, models that kind of try to estimate the price of a specific property. A simple one is obviously based on cap rates. So if we happen to know the cap rate, if we know that the cap rate is say 6%, you can take the data of the property, meaning the lease data and the management cost data and the tax data, and you can compute the sales price just based on, on, on the formula of the cap rate. That's very simple, right? The problem is that no one knows cap rate. So like it's very hard to use this formula just because uh, the left side of it is in most cases unknown. So you have many other types of valuation models to apply in, in this situation. And the most common is comps. Comps is comparable properties. Those are properties that are similar to the one that we're considering and also probably recently sold. So like you know the sales price of the comp. If you know the comps, actually you can very easily estimate the price of the property that you care about. You basically take, so in real estate, you usually take about, uh, talk about the interval price, uh, price intervals, like, you know, from the cheapest to the most expensive. You just plot those prices of comps and somewhere in the middle, most probably is gonna be the price of building, but like, you know, as you can understand, this is a very simplistic model that uh, in many cases uh, doesn't work. We can come up with a little bit more complex uh, uh, valuation models based on comps, which would be if you know what the comps are, comparable properties are, you can compute cap rates based on the comps data. So you, you know the price of the building because the building was sold recently, you know the, the uh, financial um, features of that building, so you can compute cap rate, and you can use the cap rate for estimating the price of your building, because you, you know the cap rate and you know the financial features of the building that you care about. So this is working. The only problem is that um, what is the comp? How can you figure out that the property is a comparable? Uh, we use uh, the knowledge graph for that. Usually, um, the real estate industry is so much not data-driven, like, you know, a person who deals with real estate would say, here's a comp, right? Like, here, look at that, that's a comp. That, that's pretty much how the comp is being defined. Obviously, very kind of, you know, uh, hand-wavy and rudimentary. And the right approach is, uh, at least the approach that we're using is uh, to use the knowledge graph. So if you have properties that have similar features and they also are within the same semantic neighborhood in the knowledge graph, or they're in similar semantic neighborhoods in the knowledge graph, then you can ensure that those are comps. Um, once you want to find the comp, uh, you probably need to traverse the knowledge graph, right? And with a little bit of supervision, you can say that, like, you know, once you're traversing uh, the graph from X to Y, and you know that X and Y are comparisons because you have some label data, what you can see is that this process uh, explodes really fast because the graph is well connected, right? Like if you go like on this third hop from X, you already end up with millions of properties. But with a little bit of supervision, you can see that the most important paths between X and Z all go through one node, uh, uh, sorry, between X and Y goes through one node, which is X, and you can learn the attention vector for the uh, problem of finding comps. So like uh, the attention mechanism here can be used and uh, it creates a very interesting model, by the way. I'll be happy to talk about that uh, 
offline. There are other ways of estimating uh, price of a building. This one, discounted cash flow, DC, DCF, is uh, quite involved from the financial point of view. And whoever uh, uh, is, has taken a financial math class would probably learn this uh, model. So the model is based on the fact of uh, how um, much money you want to spend now to get some cash flow in the future. And so you estimate how much money property would make and you kind of discount that, that amount by how much money you want to invest now to get this cash flow. And then since obviously you have to have a, a, a close horizon here because otherwise this number would be infinite, you would say that in 10 years you're going to sell this property and you're going to make some profits out of this uh, sale as well and you need to take this profit into account into the model like again how much money would you spend now to get that much of a yearly income plus this profit from sales so this is a more complex model but uh, it's also um, more precise if you knew how to estimate uh, your uh, income in the future and also the problem of, with this model is that it doesn't take any features of the building into account. That's why there is a completely different model that is called the replacement cost model, which takes only the building features into account. So you say, how much money would it take me now to build exactly the same building that I want to buy? It's all based on uh, construction cost data. So like there are huge tables of like, if you have this type of air conditioning, it's going to cost you that amount. If you have a different type, it's going to cost you that amount. So you sum all these expenses together, you will end up with some, some amount. And this is going to be the lower bound on the price of the building because obviously based on that, you are getting an empty building that doesn't have tenants, which essentially means that it's not making any income. That essentially means that you need to work hard to actually uh, bring the tenants to that building and uh, that costs money. So you end up with a number, but that's usually used as the lower bound, bound of uh, all the prices. And you're combining all those valuations together into what's called the football field. Like, the price of the building would probably go from the replacement cost amount that you calculated on the left to the asking price, which is usually above everything else. And you need to come up with a number somewhere in the middle, maybe probably in this case, closer to the DCF model performance, but like, you know, it really depends on uh, how you look at that. So anyhow, uh, in uh, real estate, people usually look at the, uh, price intervals. There are many uh, automated valuation models that are built by data scientists. Unfortunately, those are simple models. Like you just build a feature vector for a property and you're just throwing it to, to a regressor. And that's pretty much what those AVMs are all about. Nothing, I, I've never seen anything like substantially more complex than that. And this is a big opportunity, obviously. Like we can use all the machinery that has been created in the data science domain for the, over the last like 10 years to actually build a better model. And since those models are so simple, actually they don't work well in practice. So the result of that, the prediction of the price in commercial real estate, is pretty bad because like you remember like you know if you if you want to estimate the price of the chrysler building it's very hard to build a model uh, a machine learning model for that so we have an internal joker joker cherry that is saying that there are only two factors actually that affect the price of a property which is the buyer and the seller and if you don't take those two factors into account it's very hard to assess the value of the property because the seller will sell the same building for different prices to different buyers 
it's a negotiation process, right? So probably a better approach for estimating the price of the building is first to use owner unmasking to figure out who the owner is. And we need to use link prediction in the knowledge graph to figure out who might be a potential buyer. Again, don't forget that we're talking about commercial real estate in which there are not that many big players. Like, you know, if it's a big organization that currently owns the building, it will probably sell that building to another big organization, well known. So like what we need to do is to predict who the buyer might be. And once we have this prediction edge between the seller and the buyer, we can build in a very, very specific ABM, AVM model, evaluation model for, for this specific year. And this is probably the future of uh, uh, AVMs. Now, the biggest question is like that, like, uh, okay, we can predict this, this is gonna be the buyer, but why the seller will want to sell it all? Uh, and this is a bigger, a bigger, very big question. So there are a few real estate, uh, types of real estate players. One is a developer who is building, uh, basically constructing the, the, the building and then selling it. Another one is a flipper who buys the property, um, kind of, you know, uh, does a little bit of repairs here and there and sells it. But the vast majority of real estate investors, they just, buy property and hold on it because this property is producing income. Why should they sell it, right? And they sell a property only in the case of a distress. Distress is a very important question, especially given the fact that we are talking about uh, our times when, you know, when COVID uh, stroke really badly. And uh, there are many aspects of this distress that we need to take into account. One is obviously the structural. So like, you know, the roof is bad for in this building. This is a simpler type of distress. If the owner is strong, the owner will invest money, fix the roof, right? There is a second type, which is occupancy distress. The building is okay, but the tenant just left. The building is empty or half empty. How do you deal with that? So this is not, that impossible either because you know you use your marketing skills you make this building uh, full again but there is this third type of distress which is more difficult to deal with and that's the tenant distress the building is okay the tenant lives in this building but the tenant doesn't have money to pay for some reason and this is a very common case uh, nowadays with uh, uh, COVID-19 so uh, the tenant doesn't want to leave and the owner doesn't want the tenant to leave, but there is no cash transaction here. So like how to fix that problem, it's very difficult. And the fourth type of a distress is actually the owner distress. So the owner has some type of a problem, probably with some other properties, but the owner has like, you know, owns very good structurally and tenant wise properties that the owner probably wants to sell in order to make their financial situation better. And this is an opportunity. So if we can detect different types of distresses based on the knowledge graph, we actually can make predictions what is gonna happen with the real estate and which type of transactions will happen. So we can use uh, say label propagation in the knowledge graph, which we can say, we know that this is a property that is currently in distress or this is an owner that is currently in distress. How this distress is being propagated throughout the knowledge graph is something that needs to be estimated when it stops, how it is being re-weighted over the uh, a, a semantic neighborhood in the knowledge graph. This is an interesting question to answer and we don't have good answer to that. So if you don't mind, since I started uh, five minutes later, I'll spend another five minutes to discuss uh, uh, the maintenance of the knowledge graph. So we used a lot of data normalization to build the knowledge graph, but obviously we cannot do it perfectly. Still in the knowledge graph, you would have entities that uh, are represented by multiple nodes and we need to merge those nodes together. 
if those are three nodes on the left that are that they have the same semantic neighborhood and the nodes have similar names we need to merge them together into one and that's the entity resolution and the knowledge graph problem that is very important uh, the trouble is that if we are talking about similar names of nodes and similar semantic neighborhoods of those nodes we kind of are talking about a quadratic algorithm right so run over all the nodes and run for each node run over all the nodes again to find those similar nodes right a quadratic algorithm in the knowledge graph of half a billion nodes is not going to work so i need to come up with a different way which is to start with a neighbor so if you started with a node and looked for every other node that might be similar that's not going to work but if you start with the neighbor that has X and Z's in their uh, semantic neighborhood, then what you need to do is to run over pairs of X and Z's with uh, X and Y, sorry, within the same semantic neighborhood of Z. That creates the algorithm that is feasible computationally, and you can find uh, pairs of nodes X and Z that should be merged together because they are actually the same entity. And uh, entity disambiguation is a complement of entity resolution. So in entity resolution, you are saying there are multiple nodes in the graph that refer to the same entity. In entity disambiguation, that's the opposite. You have one node in the graph that mistakenly represents multiple entities just because this node has the same name. Here's an example. Jose Gomez is a very common name. And if you have one node in uh, the knowledge graph for Jose Gomez, it's connecting parts of the network that are completely unrelated to each other. And this is a mistake. And if you need to traverse the graph, those mistakes might uh, lead to really wrong decisions. So what we need to do is we need to split this node to multiple nodes. We need to say this is Jose Gomez 1, Jose Gomez 2, Jose Gomez 3, and then the graph is going to be correct. How do we do that? We take the semantic neighborhood of that node, Jose Gomez in our case, and we delete this node and we apply the connected component algorithm. And that essentially will split the semantic neighborhoods to multiple chunks and each chunk will represent a specific instance of the same uh, name that uh, we mistakenly put as one node. And that's how we split them. So uh, to conclude, I gave uh, an introduction to the commercial side of the real estate. Um, there are many real uh, data science challenges. There are very few um, data scientists who work in commercial real estate. And it's a very fascinating topic. And since it's currently changing uh, upside down because of COVID, this is the best opportunity for us to jump in and to work in commercial real estate and to help the industry uh, survive and get uh, substantially better in the future. And that concludes my part of the um, tutorial saying Cherry is hiring, I think is uh, kind of obvious. If you guys are interested in joining Cherry, please contact me. And with that, I am passing the microphone to Foster Provo, full professor at New York University, um, distinguished scientist and complex. Compass. Ron, why don't while I uh, while we switch the screens, um, yeah. just see if anybody has any questions for you. We I think we have, we can take a few minutes if, if if there's some questions based on what you said, and I'll switch over and get my stuff going. Sure. So anybody, if you have a question, just I think we have few enough that we can just unmute if you have a question, and then we'll and then we'll see.
All righty. So, um, so what I decided to do, because uh, Ron had given some interesting um, uh, setup for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, dig, go a little different from Ron's tack and, and dig deep into one or maybe two uh, examples. But let me give just a little bit of background, uh, background first. Um, and so, oh, when Ron was giving his, uh, his, his, his overview, uh, I pulled out uh, uh, this, which is the proceedings from the first KDD where I had a, a paper. That was KDD 1994. Um, I, uh, uh, actually, I snuck into the very first KDD, which was in 1989. I wasn't actually registered because I, I didn't know it was going to be there when it, when it, it was at uh, the HCI conference. And I snuck in and, and maybe that just like changed, changed the world for me going in. And, uh, and then I became a, a, a KDD guy. And I think Ron uh, might be interested to see that uh, my paper was actually on mining knowledge graphs. <laughs> so uh, we won't we won't talk more about wow. that right now. But uh, I could send I could I could uh, I don't know if I have an electronic copy anymore, but I could take pictures of it with my phone and send it to you. All right. So real estate. Um, let's go back to the. Um, actually, let me uh, open that up a little larger. Let's go back to the map that. Um, uh, that Ron had presented, and, and he spoke uh, about data science challenges and opportunities uh, within the commercial on the commercial side. Um, and Ali and I are going to talk more on the residential side. Uh, although it's actually interesting because Ali's uh, the Airbnb is kind of like both at the same time, and so we'll get let her let her cover that. Um, I work for a brokerage. Uh, I work for Compass. Uh, Compass is the largest uh, independent brokerage in the country. Um, uh, we have, uh, I don't know the exact count now, 18,000 odd agents, and the uh, mission of Compass is to uh, create uh, an end-to-end -end residential real estate platform to support the best agents uh, in, the, in the country. And so, um, yeah, we mainly do uh, right now uh, single-family residential. The, uh, of course, uh, um, people may get an agent in order to buy uh, a long-term rental property as well, so we can we 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 extend down 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 there, and there's also some rental uh, work that we do as well. I'm not going to talk about that at, at all because that's not the primary focus of of the of the of the company of Compass. Um, so, I think a key issue with respect to talking about the data challenges, the data science challenges from Compass's perspective, is to really understand what's Compass's business. You know, Compass's customers are real estate agents. Real estate agents' customers are buyers and sellers of property, right? And so we are building technology to make the agents as effective and as efficient as, as we possibly can to bring them more business or give them more time with their families, say. Um, and so that's the perspective that we're gonna take. And so what I thought, um, what I thought I might do is dig a little into, um, uh, uh, oh, 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 before I dig in, I, so what I, thought, what, what I thought I was going to do is to dig a little into uh, an example where you'll see there's a whole bunch of different data science problems, even within one application uh, to, support, uh, to support agents. And I'm going to follow on uh, Ron's uh, discussions of valuation. Uh, I stuck a slide in uh, at the last minute. Um, I wanted to say that... Um, Look, I've got uh, 30 minutes. Can't even come close to doing justice to the opportunities and the challenges within residential real estate in 30 minutes. Um, and especially if I want to dig deep, instead of you know sort of going through a laundry list to dig deep, I'm gonna I'm gonna even cover even even less. Uh, and so we actually have started. Um, a blog where we're going to be talking about ver all manner of different issues of applying data science to residential real estate. Uh, and so if, I mean, you're, you're here at this tutorial, so presumably you're interested in these things. And so the example that I dig into will be written up there, actually in a series of posts, because normally this is our first post. We only have one out there now. We talked about um, uh, a system that um, makes recommendations to agents for properties that are likely to sell. Um, 
and the what we what we do there is we're going to give start at a high level talking about like the interface between the application and the data science and then subsequent posts will get deeper and deeper into issues of the data science so if you're interested in this kind of stuff go follow the blog and when the posts when the future posts come out including the stuff i'll talk about now then you'll be able to read about it okay so um let's think about a particular uh task from the perspective of compass this time Right, and in particular, um, agents. Um, sorry, forget my little piece there. Okay, so agents um, are representing clients. Those clients are buyers and sellers. And so, one of the things that an agent. Let's just talk about sellers. So, you so have a real estate agent. The real estate agent would like to represent my mom. My mom is in the process of selling my uncle's house because my uncle died. Um, real estate agent would like to represent my mom in that transaction. My mom needs somebody to, re to, to represent her. She does not want to do a first sale by owner. She'd like to get somebody to help her out. She's willing to pay that person to, to help her out. Great. Perfect situation for some seller who wants to have a real estate agent, right? Um, so the real estate agents are going to come in. A lot of people just take the first person that comes, but a prudent seller is going to look at several different agents and the agents are then marketing their services. Part of that discussion is going to be how much should we price the house right and so this is now getting towards the what what ron was talking about only in this case for residential real estate and i think a key from the point of view of being a data scientist is it's not just about valuing the house right as ron was alluding to there actually is no value for a house house does not have a value there is pro there's perhaps a value for a buyer house pair, right? But different buyers have different values on the same house, right? You know, you go for a, you know, a studio apartment in Midtown. I live in Manhattan in Midtown. It has very little value for me. I don't want to live in a studio apartment in Midtown and I don't want to uh, I want to get it as a rental property, right? And so it has very little value for me, right? You know, uh, my daughter is 18, <laughs> a studio apartment in Midtown and lives in Manhattan. The studio apartment in Midtown may actually have a lot more value for my daughter, right? Um, so is it, uh, there's a value perhaps on an agent, um, on an agent home pair, right? And then the agent and the seller has to enter into a pricing discussion to figure out how much do we want to set the list price of the house at in order to be able to get the kind of buyer, the kind of potential buyers to come in and then maybe make bids. And then later we'll figure out what the, what the, what the house actually sells for. It might, we might have to take less than the listing price. There might be a bidding war and we pay and we get more, but there's a key aspect is setting the price of the house. So we're really talking about here a pricing discussion, right? And as part of those pricing discussions, Ron talked about, finding comparable properties. Part of the pricing discussion by and large is a discussion of comparable properties, right? And so one of the, one of the um, data science-based tools that we provide to agents is a tool to help with these, um, uh, to do a, co a, com a, a market analysis for, for comps um, to help, um, uh, to help with these, these discussions. And so let me go, and I want to actually show you, um, what such a tool might look like. And let's think about the challenge the, the, you know, the data science challenges. So for a comp, for, for a comparable analysis, uh, and we'll have to introduce the appropriate jargon here. We start with a subject property. That's the property that we're trying to get a trying to estimate a, a good list price for. And so the subject property is here. Um, you know, yeah, 34. I'm sorry, 225 East 34th Street, uh, apartment 10F. That's right here. Okay, and if this 34th Street uh, going diagonally, but left to left to right, right. And so the neighborhood there is Murray Hill, right? And so when you're looking for comparable properties, you want to ideally have properties that are nearby. And so we might start with saying, what are all the 
properties in the same neighborhood. Going outside the neighborhood uh, introduces additional complications, like you might go to a different school district or something like that. So ideally, you'd like to have it be in the same in the same neighborhood. And so here's a whole bunch of properties um, that uh, that either are on the market. You could look to see what they're listing at, or that have sold recently. You could see what they actually sold at, right? And so you 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 could you could have a so one data science problem problem here is a search problem to find the best possible comps. And Ron already talked a little bit about that. I'm not going to talk more about that because Ron talked about that some, but you can imagine it may be different in residential real estate from what it was in commercial real estate, right? All right. So let's go on to see what happens after we select some comps. So here is a, here is a view where we see, you know, again, we see the subject property, the same subject property. And then the columns here are different potential comps. And so maybe from the search interface, uh, the agent is selected. I like these ones. I like these potential comps or the, you know, the, the AI system might have selected for them. That's not really relevant here. And let's look at one of those comps. The one that's highlighted in red there, it's in the same building. So another apartment that is a similar apartment in the same building sounds like an ideal comp, right? We even look to see, yes, they're both one bedroom, one bath, and they have about the same square footage, uh, uh, 731, 782. Great, right? So do we just go and take the closing price from that comp and say, ah, this comp looks like it should be, we should price it at, we just use this comp, right? Ron also mentioned you look at multiple comps and then you do some aggregation across them. But let's just consider this one comp, right? And we look at the closing price. Should we just take 100, uh, 1.1 million? Um, oh, by the way, the closing price on this one here is from when it sold back in 2007, just for reference. So back in 2007, it sold for uh, 870 grand. Um, the comp in the same building, same, about the same size, sells for 1.1 1, 1. 1 million. Um, okay, so the answer is no. We can't just take that price. Why? Because it sold back in April of last year. This is August of 2020. Things are different now. You know, they, things would be different no matter what because the, because we have a lot of uh, the, the market changes, this seasonality, and then there's just general changes in the market. And right now we also had issues with respect to COVID and big changes in the market because of COVID, right? So how could we figure out, how do we use this comp if in fact the price probably isn't quite right, right? And so it's a data science problem. We can adjust the comp based on the fact that it's sold um, more than a year ago in this case. In the tool, you can go and you can add adjustments. And so let's see what that would look like. Okay, so here we go and we can add adjustments. And so the under underneath, there's a model that's going to suggest that, well, since, since that, since this, this is the comp now. And so remember what we're trying to do. So let's back up for a second and remember what we're trying to do here. We have this comp. We want to use that comp to estimate the, 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 the value or the price that we should, that we might sell at of the subject property. What we really want to do is to adjust the price of that comp, make that comp more and more similar to the subject property and, that, and adjust its price accordingly, right? And by the way, another chat, another data science challenge. There is no ground truth here. It's not like we build a supervised model. You know, there is no ground truth at all. There is no such thing as taking that house and moving it forward in time and seeing what the price would be. Let's just say it wasn't in the same building. It was, you know, a half a mile away. There's no such thing as taking that house from a half a mile away, moving it over here and seeing what the price would be if it happened to be here. So that's just a challenge. We'll deal with it. Um, okay, so the model says, well, the system says, we'll talk about the model in a second. System says, ah, since that house sold in April 2019, there has been a 5% decrease in market prices. Therefore, you should decrease that 1.1 million by $51,000, right? Again, lots of data science challenges here, right? You know, how do you actually build models to say how you should change prices over time. Well, actually, this is a well 
understood problem. People uh, have been building actually price indices for real estate for a long, long time, and they actually track the changes in price over time, right? But most of those are done on, on the level of an entire market, right? It's not clear what we would want for adjusting a comp to be the, uh, the application of one of these um, market trend models across the whole market to this comp, right? And so we have in many of these problems that, you know, that we face, we have a question. Do we want to do the country? Do we want to do the state? Do we want to do the metro area? Do we want to do the, um, the, 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 the city? Do we want to do like for Manhattan, right? Do we do New York City or do Manhattan? Manhattan's one of the five boroughs of New York City, right? Or do we do Murray Hill, the very local neighborhood, right? Um, it turns out that I'm not claiming that any of this is the best that could be done, uh, but what this 5% uh, um, decrease is based upon the local area, an aggregation of some zip codes around the, around the current zip code. Um, um, okay, so that's one, just one model. I mean, it's a sophisticated model, right, that actually goes and it does tracking the changes in home prices for every locality across the country, well, everyone where we have a where we have agents right now. Um, okay. Here's a, here's a, this is actually a different uh, uh, a different comp in a different building. Same, actually, this is just a different this is a different comparison. I just wanted to show you a, a different sort of comp, right? Uh, this is saying that hey, that comp is nine floors higher. Really? We're gonna actually adjust the price because it's at a different floor. Oh, absolutely. If you're not from Manhattan, I actually was going out and looking at looking at apartments and I went to this new develop fancy new development. Um, uh, um, and they were charging fifty thousand dollars difference per floor. I didn't buy in that building, by the way. Um, the, this is this so 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 there's a there's modeling, and the modeling it turns out has to be building by building. Most buildings, and that was an extreme case, most buildings actually don't have $50,000 differences in floors. But as you move up the building, you have a different value. The higher up you are, you know, up to a certain point, the higher up you are, the more valuable the apartment is. That's both because of uh, moving you away from street noise and also because you're more likely to have a better view. Um, sometimes there's discontinuities, like when you pass the building next to you and you can actually have a view, um, you know, but and these are these could be complicated, uh, complicated to model, but this has to actually be done. Again, there's this aggregation issue, right? You can't do every 10 floor building separately. But you also if you have some big 50 story building, right, it probably is different from another 50 story 50 story building. So again, here is a data science problem. It's completely different underlying data science effort then that first one, the temporal estimation, still underlying the same application. Let's go on. All right, here's, this, uh, here's our 34th Street, 225 34th Street subject property again. And over here, right, we have a property on, uh, up on uh, East 40th Street. Um, and the suggestion, from the system is, hey, that's actually a significantly less expensive area, right? So in order to make that comp comparable, we're effectively taking what if that property were actually moved over to this location? Because this location is a more expensive area, we need to bump up the price on the comp. That's actually interesting. We can actually look a little more deeply into that particular example. Here is um, the dotted line is thirty is thirty fourth Street. This is our oops, this is our subject property. And up here on Fortieth Street, oops, is our comparable. They're actually kind of directly in line with each other in terms of Manhattan North and South. And you can see by the, the, this is a heat map where the coloring has to do with the 
actually it's 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 a it's kind of a nearest neighbor price per square foot it's a more it's more sophisticated than that you take prices of properties again a whole different data science challenge right you take the prices of properties you use the temporal model we talked about before to bring them all up to the present time you divide through by the square footage you get an estimation of the local price per square foot in an area, and then you figure out the size of the area that makes sense with respect to some homogeneity in, in, in prices, right? And so this area, actually, Murray Hill, actually has a huge differences in the prices for the homes there, right? You know, the blue ones are actually relatively low price per square foot. R red ones are very high price per square foot. Orange ones are in the middle, right? Um, and so it turns out that in this particular area, it depends on which building you're in. The, the, the blocks are obviously the blocks and then the different, you can see the different buildings, you know, and the different buildings have, have, have markedly different values, right? And so here, what's going on with this different location, it's not that you're going into another school district or something like that. It's that that building actually sells for, that comp building sells this one, Right, sells for mark the apartments there sell for markedly less per square foot than the than the subject building. We have to adjust for that. Um, I just thought I would give an example. Here is an example that's the more common. Like if you're not really talking about huge buildings in Midtown Manhattan, um, this is Washington Heights, the very very north tip of Manhattan, um, and. Um, this was a there was basically a subject property down here right and then comps were found all over this neighborhood washington heights right and you look to see that again this very very there's a lot of difference the the legend is showing here the colors by the way are different from the midtown manhattan prices midtown manhattan prices are way higher than the than the prices up here so the color scale is scaled to the to the size of the view right and so you know as, let's just go up here and take a look at the north part of Washington Heights, right? What's going on here? You have, again, an area on the left that is very, this is Broadway. I mean, if you're to the uh, west of Broadway, right, we're very, uh, relatively very expensive. And if you're, to the, uh, if you're to the east of Broadway, not so much. Turns out Broadway, I come from uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania, and, and it's an it's a area with, in the uh, foothills of the Appalachians, and basically you have the runs going down all the hills. It's all hills, it's all mountains and hills. The runs go down, there's roads actually paved on top of these creeks or rivers or whatever, and, though, and so Broadway is like a run going down there, and you actually have a big hill here, and then you have another hill here. This hill, if you're right here, you look out over the Hudson River. This is called Hudson Heights, which you can't really see because it's blocked, right? This is a steep hill. You go here, there's this switchback. It comes up here, it comes up here. This is up here is an awesome park. It's where the Cloisters is. It has a mile loop in it, right? This is like a very nice playground here. I know this area very, very, very well. This is an awesome neighborhood, right? You know. And down here, it's a, it's much more a, a sort of average, average northern Manhattan neighborhood, right? You know, and so the um, a local agent would know that, right? And this actually gives some quantification to that, or gives some view to someone who maybe doesn't do work up there, but now there's a, now there's a, they have a buyer client who wants to go up there and uh, and, and 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 work up there. Um, Right. And so the, again, what this, what this does is it uses a combination of a geographic uh, nearest neighbor style um, um, model um, and then applies this temporal adjustment to move all the prices because you don't really know the values of the homes for a nearest neighbor. You only know what they sold for. But if you have the, the temporal model, you can adjust things up to what they would have sold for, sold for today. Okay. Um, right. And what about other differences between uh, other differences be between home, right? Uh, what happens if a home has a pool? 
or doesn't have a pool? What if a home has a garage or doesn't have a garage? Uh, what about a home with a spectacular view that's on the street where you just turn the corner and then that house has a spectacular view, right? These are all hard data science problems to, to solve, right? Um, uh, there are other, um, there are other uh, vendors out there who do things like this. Uh, and if you talk to them, they run a regression and then see what the coefficient in the regression is, right? You know, that actually doesn't quite work because um, there's huge selection bias in the data. This is really a causal inference problem we're talking about. What would the effect on the price be if you were to add or subtract a pool? What would the effect on the price be if this house had a two car garage? Right. This is the a fundamental data science problem that we're uh, that we're talking about here. Um, and again, um, once again, even in this one application, a yet another and com rather completely different sort of data science problem. Right. And so um, I'm going to stop there. Um, and I think Ali is going to maybe talk a little bit about some causal inference things. So hopefully there's a tie. Uh, uh, there's, there's a tie in to the stuff that she'll that she'll talk about. And again, um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, we're going to we talk about the details, for instance, of the likely to sell modeling. And there's a whole bunch of interesting challenges there. It sounds on the surface like a very straightforward application of classifier learning, right? It's actually cool and interesting and challenging. Uh, so go follow that AI at Compass uh, uh, blog on Medium and we'll update, we'll, we'll continue to put out uh, um, blog posts that give details on the data science behind some of these things. Um, so why don't I um, see if anybody has questions and I'll uh, quit sharing and then Ali can get uh, set up for, for her session. Questions, anybody? Uh, can I ask one quick question? Um, <clears throat> when you have, do all the adjustments, are the adjustments usually independent of each other or do you guys think about how they might interact? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So. The adjustments are absolutely not independent of each other. They are intricately dependent. And so if you think about it, um, let's just say you do a simple square footage adjustment. By the way, you think of it as I, I, didn't, I didn't show that because it seemed too simple for this audience. It's actually not so simple. And so one of those, especially in Manhattan, right? One of those apartments actually had 50 more square feet than the other, right? That's like a $30,000 difference on that, on, that, on that apartment, just 50 more square feet. Right, but you can't just apply, you know, do some division, right? It turns out that the adjustments with square footage alone aren't uh, linear, which you can think of as if you go down to one square foot, it's probably not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to buy that apartment for one square foot for the cost of a square foot. Um, but think about this. If you were to adjust the price up to today, it sold a while back, you have to change the price by 10% for today. And you had done the square footage before or you do the square footage adjustment later, it's gonna be a different adjustment. And so um, a quick answer to what to do about that is um, you can look to see what appraisers do because appraisers do this kind of work, right? And generally they have like a, um, let's call it a storyboard where they walk through things in a particular order, right? And then basically you can say, all right, first we're going to adjust the, the thing for the time, adjust it up to today. Then we'll do the, the square footage adjustment, but we'll do it based upon the price that was adjusted to today, you know, and so, far, so on and so forth. Um, that's like an easy answer. Um, and then of course, even within some of those things, there's going to be interactions between features when you're doing the causal uh, modeling and so on. All right, Ali, you want to uh, move yeah. us over to, uh, uh, Let's to do the it. Airbnb world? Let's do it. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll be talking about the home sharing business. So data science challenges in home sharing, bringing it back to, there we go. Oh, there we go. Bringing it to Ron's little taxonomy here. I'll be talking about the bottom left um, bucket, kind of the most, the, the short-term rental um, marketplace. That being said, Airbnb, as Foster said, really operates in a few of these buckets. We, we have 
uh, boutique hotels, we have multifamily homes. A lot of hosts actually offer uh, long-term rentals in addition to short-term rentals, but um, kind of the bread and butter is in the bottom left. So that's what I'll be talking about most. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm um, a senior data science manager for the Marketplace Dynamics team. It covers a fascinating area. Um, I'm biased, but it's, it's so it includes pricing, monetization, cancellations, competitive intelligence, and supply and demand dynamics. I've been at Airbnb for about three years. Two of those I've spent on the Marketplace Dynamics team. Before that, I was on the host side. And I, as mentioned today, I'm an economist by training. I might come through a little bit today. A lot of the examples are pulling from kind of economics or econometrics space, but we also do a lot of um, things more in the predictive analytics ML space, but I'll be talking about that a little bit less today. I'm a, before that, I was in economic consulting. So that's when you work on big uh, lawsuits in which you need um, expert testimony, basically. For example, what's gonna happen if two companies merge or do we think prices are gonna go up or go down? Um, you need data, but you also need economic theory to make predictions there. And all of this sort of started with um, me getting a PhD in economics. Cool. So that's me. What's Airbnb? Um, my guess is a lot of you know a bit about Airbnb, but I'll just give a really, really brief um, introduction. Airbnb really is about democratizing hospitality through home sharing. And we do that through sort of allowing the average guests, the average host and communities to participate in hospitality. And so if you look across the globe um, today, almost or over 2 million guests stay at, in Airbnbs every night. Um, and it's, there's a wide uh, price range, right? So it's kind of, it, you, can, you can find budget options, but you can also find absolute luxury um, uh, villas. Um, similarly, on the hosting side, we think of it's democratizing it. You don't have to be a business. You don't have to have a um, big building. Uh, the average host can host. Uh, you can even, you know, host a, a shared room. Um, somebody stays in your room, doesn't have a private room. Um, and lastly, Airbnb also um, provides support to communities. So over the last 10 years, we've used our uh, disaster response tool over 100 times. Uh, so this is where hosts open up their homes um, in times of crises. Um, it's relevant right now with the fires in California. Most recently, we um, opened up, uh, hosts opened up, uh, I think it was over 200,000 listings to frontline stays workers with respect to COVID. And there's kind of two reasons that allow Airbnb to quickly respond to disasters or also just events. One of them is proximity. So if you look at, um, We've talked about New York a lot today. I'm going to talk about Boston for a second. So if you look at Boston, if you look at hotels locations in Boston, they're, they're kind of centralized either downtown or Copley Square. If you overlay Airbnb listings, they're kind of everywhere, right? So if there's any event or any disaster, it's um, the proximity to that event or lo disaster location is going to be, it's probably going to be closer. So that's, that's one. The other thing is that supply on Airbnb is, is very elastic. Um, so if there's an event, um, supply can come, come onto the platform. That's different than kind of traditional hospitality. It's hard to build a hotel overnight, but it is actually not hard to list your listing overnight. And an example of that is um, the Eclipse. So I remember this quite well because I started at Airbnb, I think one or two weeks before this start happened. Um, so when the eclipse happened in 2017 and kind of cut across the country, um, many uh, people stayed in Airbnbs, many more than in, in hotel rooms. And uh, what was interesting is that actually half of the hosts who hosted, this was the first time hosting. So they really, there was this elastic response to, um, to the eclipse. So that's Airbnb. Um, where does Airbnb sort of fit in? We talked um, about a few different companies today in different industries. I think of Airbnb sort of sitting in at the intersection of a few interesting circles. One is um, online platforms, another is the sharing economy, and a third is uh, real estate. And so that's a bit abstract. So um, I thought I'd fill it in with a few examples of companies you might know, um, or you definitely know. So kind of a behemoth in the online platform circle is, is Google. Um, if you look at the kind of the intersection between sharing economy and online platforms, that also encompasses companies like Uber and Lyft. 
if you look at the intersection between real estate and online platforms, you have companies like Zillow or Compass. And I'll talk a bit about these intersections and different challenges that um, arise for data scientists in particular at these intersections. So starting with the sharing economy meeting online platforms. So companies like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. So what are some, some common challenges or opportunities that data scientists um, or more broad, broadly these companies face? One is these are all two-sided markets. And by that, I mean kind of two-sided markets in the most narrow sense of the word, because there's more definitions of two-sided markets out there than I think there are two-sided markets. But uh, it, think of a company that I, that, so how I, th I think of that definition is for Airbnb to exist, hosts need guests and guests need hosts, right? That's different than Google, which is sometimes also described as a two-sided market, because if I think of um, searchers, um, coming to Google, they don't need advertisers. Advertisers need searchers, but the majority of searchers coming to Google are not actually looking for ads. It's just Google's monetization strategy. So here it's really that one side of the market absolutely needs the other and Airbnb needs both, both to exist. Another thing that's very particular to, to these industries is supply constraints. So if um, a given listing or a given car for let's say Uber at a given time doesn't, it, you know is taken it you can't get it back um that's it's uh it's there's these strong supply constraints it's again a little bit different than ads which often you can show the exact same ad to to the next person for airbnb that's actually in, in addition interesting because of the heterogeneous goods cars are a little bit more similar but listings are quite different so uh, once it's gone it's gone um a third similarity is, or commonality is supply elasticity so i just talked about that that um, there, there can be an elastic response um, in, to increased demand through the price mechanism. And uh, a fourth one is that additional supply or demand, let's stick with supply for a second, is not um, necessarily incremental. By that I mean, if you, if you add additional supply to a marketplace, yes, it will bring additional bookings, but, um, or rides, uh, if, you, if you add cars, um, but all those might not be incremental. They might be stealing bookings from other supply on the, on the platform. And that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. I know it's something that Uber and Lyft spend a lot of time thinking about. And sort of a, that's the one I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on. Um, I could spend an hour on it, but I'll spend a few minutes on it. Uh, and yeah, the takeaway for data science there is that we really need to understand and measure incrementality um, closely. So I'll give two examples of how we do that. One is on the modeling front and another is on the experimentation front. On the modeling front, we use a kind of canonical economics model called um, Cobb-Douglas. It's used in the um, labor market literature a lot. It's used to describe, okay, you have capital and you have labor and together it produces widgets, basically widgets of any good. And um, Airbnb has used it to describe the, um, our marketplace. So you have supply and you have demand and together supply and demand produces bookings. And you also have a, a efficiency parameter A that kind of sucks up some other things of how well you're matching supply and demand um, in, in a given uh, geography or a given segment. And very concretely how we, how we use this is um, you fit this model, this um, model that I'm just showing right here, um, using historical supply and demand data and um, that's how you get your parameters. You predict future supply and predict future demand, and then you can use the predictions of supply and demand and those parameters you just estimated to calculate the incremental return of adding supply or demand. So concretely, we use this in a lot of ways across Airbnb, but very concretely, one example is if I know the return to adding an extra unit of supply in San Francisco is much higher than in San Jose, then, then that's maybe where I would send my sales agents. You know, this is where I would start adding, um, trying to add supply. So that's on the modeling front. We also think about incrementality a lot or have to think about it a lot with, to not draw wrong conclusions on the experiment front. Uh, basically, so imagining an experiment where we're treating um, a certain set of listings, we're giving them some feature, maybe a badge, something that makes them look better. And let's say that it really works, like these listings get booked a lot more. Um, 
And so two things can happen. On the one hand, what could happen is these listings get guests who would have not booked otherwise. That's that green guest here. That's good. That's, that's good variation. On the other hand, what can also happen is that these listings steal bookings from guests that would have otherwise booked from a control listing. So these are not incremental. These are just stolen. And that's not good, right? This will overestimate the effect. And this is what we call cannibalization or interference bias. And there's, there's various ways to deal with it. I'll, I'll kind of touch on three um, cluster experimentation, switchbacks, and double randomization. And I'll just kind of give the high level intuition. This is another one where I could spend at least an hour on each of them. The kind of intuition behind cluster experimentation is to increase the size of the experiment unit so that that interference or cannibalization doesn't happen. So let's say, um, I'm looking for a listing in, let's take San Francisco again. I'm probably not going to stay in San Jose. So San Jose is probably not going to be stealing listings from me. So maybe that cluster is good enough. Um, and when you decide on how, how big to make your cluster, you have to think about um, two things. On the one hand, like you might want to make it really large to so take countries. Um, if, I, if I'm going to Germany, there's probably listings in France are probably not going to be stealing bookings from me, uh, maybe at the border. Uh, but the problem with that is we'd have almost no power. We'd have, to be precise, you know, 191 observations. So that's, that doesn't quite work. So um, that's kind of the trade-off, this power and bias, bias trade-off. One way that um, ride-sharing companies in particular have tried to get around this is to add another variation, like another dimension. In addition to um, assigning treatment and control at the geography level, they, they add a time dimension. So what they do is, um, so take, for example, here, if you look at New York, New York is in treatment from 4.30 to 5.30, um, and let's say dr for drivers, then from um, 5.30 to 6.30, it's in control, so on and so forth. The, the pro is that gives you a lot more power, which is good. And the con for Airbnb or any you know, real estate um, company is that our search process is just is, is too long or for, 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 the, for this to work easily. Um, if I start searching um, for a listing today, I might not book today. It often takes days, sometimes even weeks. So it's very unclear how to define those um, search windows. Very different from, from Uber or Lyft. A third way that we're actually exploring um, a bit more right now actually at, at Airbnb is um, double randomization. So this is where um, you break both supply and demand into treatment and control. And then if both are treated uh, in the treatment treated bucket, that's when you apply the treatment. And you can then um, start estimating cannibalization by comparing quadrants. So for example, um, if you were to compare quadrant B to quadrant A here, you're looking at um, control listings, um, but some guests are um, in the, on the treatment side are being stolen from treated listings. So that is pure cannibalization. So this is one way to, to kind of get an estimate, estimate of listing side cannibalization. Let's move on to, before going too deep, um, let's move on to another of these intersections between um, online platforms and real estate. Um, so companies like Airbnb, Zillow, Compass, um, what do they have in common? One is that goods are very heterogeneous. Um, Ron showed a few houses that looked similar, but I mean, the majority, even, even they are somewhat different. And uh, um, for the majority of cases, they're, they're not that similar. So good, goods are heterogeneous. Data is pretty sparse. Um, it means some people buy a lot of houses, but the majority buy houses, you know, once or twice, maybe in their lifetime, um, or with respect to Airbnb, people stay in, guests stay in listings, you know, maybe once or twice a year. So it's, it's not like we have a ton of data coming in. Another um, challenge is the long feedback loop. So for example, with respect to Airbnb, um, there's a guest might find a home, then they decide to actually, okay, this is the one I want. Then they contact the host, then the host accepts, then you take the trip, then you leave a review. This in some instances is, is a matter of days, but often it's a matter of months. So it takes a long time for us to, to get feedback on whether how the whole process went. Was this, was this good? Um, was the guest happy? Was the host happy? 
Um, and that's kind of the one I wanna, I wanna focus on, which is the takeaway for data science or an interesting problem for data science here is that we need to think about long-term effects um, carefully. Like for, for, we can't just run an experiment and expect to have all the answers within a few days. Um, one way we've started to think about long-term effects at Airbnb is we devised a concept called a future incremental value. Um, and the idea is to measure the long-term impact of actions that hosts or guests take. Um, and how that works is, or maybe first let me give an example. Um, um, so imagine a guest um, gets canceled on by a host. There, there's a short-term impact that the guest, uh, that the trip doesn't happen, we lose the revenue, the guest is unhappy. But there's also a long-term impact, which is uh, that that guest might never come back. So that's, that's an example of like short and, short and long-term. And so, so how the, the kind of model that we built of future incremental value, it, it uses propensity score matching to find like guest and host twins who are otherwise identical, but one of them, let's say gets canceled on, the other one doesn't. Or one of them adds an amenity, we're actually using it for that as well, which ties back to what Foster was talking about earlier. What's if a host adds um, a, um, a jacuzzi, um, what's the value of that? It's not just gonna come right away, it's probably gonna take a few months to, to see the value of adding a jacuzzi. Uh, and so, so one example, we, we've now used this across all teams at Airbnb, but one example of uh, learning that we've had through this is um, how important the quality of a, a good stay is. Um, if you compare a complaint stay to a perfect stay, the, the present value is, is very similar, but the future value is, is higher for the perfect stay, and that's because the guest is more likely to come back. So um, lastly, let's talk a little bit about the um, intersection between kind of sharing economy and, and real estate. Um, this is, gets a little bit spicy and it's um, something that's maybe more particular to Airbnb than, than other companies, but uh, another actor that starts coming in is um, cities or um, municipalities, regulators. Um, Cities' concerns uh, really vary from, from city to city. Some cities want to spur economic development. Um, some cities are worried about over-tourism or have housing concerns about um, long-term rentals being converted to short-term rentals and increasing rents. Um, uh, some, some cities are looking to have more tax revenue. So there's a lot of different um, cities concerns and Airbnb really works with individual cities to understand what, what, what they're looking for and to see if we can come to a common solution. Um, one takeaway for data science in particular is that we need to really understand and measure the impact of regulation, both to understand what happened backwards looking, but also to provide um, policymakers with the necessary data to make the best decisions going forward so that um, when they are negotiating, um, they are negotiating um, with all the data. So how do we measure the impact of various regulations? So the ideal for a data scientist, right, would be an experiment. I, could, I would randomly assign some jurisdictions to be regulated and then others not, and then I'd compare them over time. Unfortunately, it's not how it works. It's usually a very messy process. Um, we decide on a few cities that we work with. Um, and uh, and end up with some 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 regulation uh, that usually takes longer than originally um, designed. So what, what we resort to is quasi-experimental methods. So think difference and differences, event studies, synthetic control. One of those is, is synthetic control. I'll talk about that one a bit more. So how how we use synthetic controls is so imagine there's a city. Um, let's call so let's say it's Prague. Um, and Prague gets hit with a regulation. So what we can do is we can look at Prague, that's the treat, treatment city, and we can construct a synthetic control city. Um, and the synthetic control is basically a, like a weighted combination of other cities that then together look like Prague. And those weights are based on um, data prior to the, the event date. And then you can follow the treatment and control after the event date and see what happens. So Prague here is really what I would call a placebo. Nothing happened in Prague in 2016. So whew, luckily the treatment and control continued to move similarly. So that means our method is working and, um, and, and that's why the, 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 the lines look similar. 
let's look at an example where there actually was a shock. It wasn't a regulatory shock, but there was a supply shock. So this was a hurricane that hit um, Puerto Rico in 2017. And when you compare it, the, it, the treatment, you know, Puerto Rico to its synthetic control, you see a big drop in supply. And then you see supply slowly coming, slowly coming back. If you compare that to demand, demand actually recovers much more quickly. So it also has, you know, drops off like a cliff when the hurricane hits, but then it recovers more quickly. And this is actually tied to make, making a full loop to what we talked about earlier, which is the incrementality. So even if the supply doesn't fully recover, the existing supply that is still there absorbs some of that demand. And so that's why the demand recovers more quickly than the supply. I I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the, I hope so, so some takeaways, if I didn't do a, a terrible job, is that home sharing is, is you know, full of complex data science challenges. Um, those data science, data science challenges don't exist in a vacuum. They, they, they overlap a lot with other industries and other companies. And it's really just a very, very small sample, sample of challenges. And um, if you have any questions, or if you want to work as a data scientist at Airbnb for hiring as well, please um, don't hesitate to contact me. So. Any questions you can also ask now. Um, you don't have to email me. Does anyone have uh, questions? While you're thinking of your question, I forgot to say, and I would be remiss to my employer if I didn't, that uh, Compass is hiring data scientists too. So uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, go search on Google. I think you'll find all of our uh, uh, companies out there trying to, trying to get more data scientists. Yeah, real estate industry definitely needs more data scientists. No doubt about it. Okay, if we don't have questions, then what we'll do is we'll go for a break. The break is uh, right now, it's supposed to be about 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, and the break is going to go till 10.30. I'll uh, stop recording, so feel free to come back at 10.30, and it's going to be the fireside at... Uh, it's going to be between the three of us with uh, Vanya Yosifovsky, the CTO of uh, Homes at uh, Airbnb. So we have a question in the, um, in the chat. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that the topic of the, I mean, we may, who knows where we will go. It's a fireside chat after all. But um, what we're going to try to focus on is issues about actually um, practically doing data science so, so uh, beyond what we get at a normal KDD conference or in machine learning classes and stuff like that, what are some of the uh, practical issues of actually doing it in practice using real estate and our, and our companies as a, as a context? The question in the um, chat from Rohan is, uh, any difficulties with getting clean data model fitting for production functions? For example, collinearity, endogeneity, um, source X, Uber data scientist was working on production functions. And sorry for not asking out loud as Mike's not working. Oh yeah, this is, yeah. A, really great, this is a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. I can talk about this one for quite a bit as well. Um, so yeah, so we've, one of the challenges we face with the uh, Cobb Douglas production function, and I'm sure you, you guys have as well, is how do you validate this, right? <laughs> it's, it's hard to have a real source of truth. Um, we thought about different ways, but, um, there are challenges with these ideas. For example, I mean, ideally we would add a bunch of supply in a given geography and then see if the incremental returns we, you know, predict are the same in, in reality, right? Um, but, but doing that um, is hard. We've thought about things like you could hide, you could do it the other way around. You could hide a lot of supply in search ranking, for example, but that comes with major degradations for the user experience. Um, so, so we haven't done that. Um, the one way that we have, I would say, sort of validated at the most aggregate level is actually with the cluster experimentation that I talked about earlier. So we get the same estimates um, of, of incrementality when we do this cluster experiments um, with 
co compared to what our uh, incrementality model spits out. So that was a very, very good kind of validation that, that our uh, estimates, estimates of incrementality match up from a model to experiment. But that's only at the very, very aggregate, like across the globe, basically, right? And ideally, we would validate this, you know, at a geo cross segment, which um, we have not been able to do. As for Cherry, it is a little bit different because, yes, the evaluation problem uh, is very difficult, but uh, we are kind of lucky because uh, uh, we have many partners. Uh, Cherry is in the data integration uh, space, so we are integrating data from uh, different partners, and some of them provide the types of data that we're trying to model maybe in a substantially smaller scale, but still we have access to at least some data points that we can consider uh, ground truths, which not always are truths, but in many cases are very close. So we, if we are comparing our models with these ground truths and we're seeing a high overlap, we would say, yeah, sure. So like it really looks like we are in the right direction and our model works for on scale. So like uh, we can compare a few data points and then apply it to like uh, 150 million properties in the United States. So it's uh, not trivial obviously, but kind of working. And um, uh, lucky for us, uh, like Airbnb is pretty much the dominating company in, in, in your space, right, Ali? And for us, it's, uh, there are many companies around that we can uh, leverage upon. We can talk more at the okay. Fireside Chat about issues like this. I mean, you know, for Compass, we have, a, we have our own data on all the listings and, uh, and uh, prior sales and so on that uh, um, uh, you can, for instance, go search on the on the compass.com uh, website, similar to what you would do on Zillow. Uh, we also uh, ingest uh, um, lots and lots of public record data. Um, and then, you know, there's always the issue of what you really want to know depends a lot on the problem. And so let's just take likely to sell, you know, the likely to sell uh, estimation problem that I had briefly talked about in which we have the blog entry for. Um, well, of course, you never actually uh, observe anybody's likelihood of selling, but that's a sort of standard problem we have, right? And so we observe a draw from that sometimes, which is whether or not somebody actually does sell, right? And then, oh, that's a little bit of a problem because actually you have to wait Depends on like likelihood to sell what tomorrow. I can tell you what the probability there is. It's zero or just near that for any given individual, right? You know, all right. So it has to be over some period of time. You know, let's just say that what we do is over a year, but now you have to wait a year to like know whether or not, uh, you know, you, you, the answer is no. You might observe some of the yeses before that, right? And then on the other side, what actually predicts likelihood to sell? There's all manner of very personal stuff that is the, are the drivers of people selling their properties. And Ron talked about some of these things, right? And so some of these things you're never going to observe. Other ones you actually do observe. And as a question, like, for instance, um, people die. You don't actually observe that they die, but you can observe that the actual deed for the home was transferred in a zero cost transaction, right? Question is, can you get that in a timely enough manner to do something with it, right? You know, you people actually change jobs to a different uh, state, right? Can you observe that? Well, kind of like, you know, I mean, if you're watching them on LinkedIn, you might be able to do it and so on and so forth. There's all these problems that aren't directly there in, re in real estate data that you would have. And are you going to be able to get them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes you can get a proxy for them. So we'll have it uh, in, a, in depth in this uh, fire chat in about half an hour. So what I'll propose is to get for a break. Uh, get out for a break and we are going to be back at uh, 10 30 the four of us with uh, Vanya Yusufovsky see you guys uh, in about half an hour 25 minutes actually the recording um, I'll re reiterate on the um, names of the presenters just to, to introduce uh, everyone again so 
The moderator of this discussion is going to be Professor Foster Prova uh, from New York University, and he is also the distinguished scientist at uh, Compass, which is a very big real estate uh, agency. Um, we have Eli Rao, who is the senior manager of a big data science team at Airbnb, and the fourth person who uh, is joining us for, for this site, uh, fireside chat is Vyan Kisowski, who is the CEO of Homes at Airbnb. I don't know if everyone has lost your mic there. Want to try again? Yeah, you guys have troubles to hear me, right? Not right now, not anymore. It went all garbled there for a second. Okay, so if I do it again, just let me know. Okay. You were just introducing uh, Vanya, by the way. It may just be when you talk about Vanya. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That'll be my name. I can kick it off, um, you know. And so that's Vanya. He's the CTO of Airbnb for Homes. Uh, uh, he could tell you more about himself as soon as he starts uh, talking, if he'd like, or else we could just go. Um, I'm going to um, moderate our uh, our um, uh, fireside chat. So we have some questions that uh, we had uh, decided were um, great to kick things off. Um, and then we'll see where the discussion goes. And then if you guys have questions, you can uh, either raise your hand, write something in the chat, unmute yourself. I mean, I think there's few enough of us that if we, you know, if we have a break and you wanna, you wanna jump in, uh, please, please feel free. Uh, I'm gonna actually start things off um, by sharing my screen here. Um, all right. So one of the places, one of the things that I actually thought. Reese that was has been interesting recently. So there was an article um, that exemplifies this phenomenon uh, in the Wall Street Journal a couple months back. But there's another set of articles in the Economist that say this, and, and I've seen it elsewhere as well, right? And and so Mims, who was author of this Wall Street Journal article, pointed out that businesses are furloughing data scientists and complaining that they can't find uses for AI. And in that article, he was focusing largely on predictive analytics as AI. He called that out specifically, um, but of course, it, you know, things are broader than that. And so um, I guess my starting question uh, is, you know, well, real estate has, uh, is historically not, um, uh, historically not uh, had much impact from data science, present companies excluded. Um, and uh, is this just because there just aren't, not, uh, are not very many uses? For data science in the real estate industry, uh, I thought we might uh, go around the room and just see about can we um, can we at least start out with listing out broadly. We talked deeply, kind of in the you know in the first half of the tutorial. Think broadly about the about the different um, possible uh, use cases or wish lists or applications of data science within real estate for our, each of our, from each of the perspectives of each of our different co companies. Um, how we start with, uh, it's not quite the order I have here because I have some lists that you guys gave me, uh, but maybe Airbnb can, uh, can start it off. All right, but you need to be a little bit more precise because that's two of us here, right? Yeah, yo, you guys get to, I'm not going to pick. You guys get to you go get ahead. To... We haven't heard from you yet, Vanya. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I think, you know, in, in the larger scope of things, if data is created and captured, you have always use for data science and machine learning. And traditionally, I think when you look at the explosion of data in the world with, with the web in the nineties, um, the data that it's easy to deal with, it's a lot of data. Uh, there was a problem with dealing with a lot of data 
in the prior decades, we don't have that problem anymore. It's a lot of data, it's a data on similar things. The real estate data, I think it's a little bit more difficult data because there's less of it. You don't buy a house every day. And also there is, the data is heterogeneous. It's about the, the, the units of, of reasoning are very different. So I feel that in terms of data science application, uh, there are many, 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 and I, you know, I think Ali, maybe you can, you can give a little bit of the things that we're working at Airbnb, but the meta point here is that I feel that some of the problems that we're, I was an interview for the article and, and that's too bad. Maybe I would have given a contrarian opinion there, but uh, some of the problems we see here is that the real estate data science requires non-traditional and, and honestly, more advanced and more sophisticated methods and uh, people who are capable of doing that type of thing might be far and in between, I think. And while the article is probably referring to the run of the mill kind of stuff that, that, that other companies are doing um, more in line with what's done in the ads world, maybe that will be my somewhat controversial, uh, maybe. Right. Let's uh, come back to that. Let's, uh, because, uh, um, you and I probably will be in somewhat agreement on our on our contrarian view there. So, uh, but but Ali, we have a bit. We have a big list. Do you want to uh, talk a little about the breadth of? Yeah, I mean, um, the list is so long. I have to scroll it so that we can <laughs> see all the different. And I'm sure you just stopped at three dozen because that's right. That's right. I, I could I could go on forever. Um, I think maybe one lens that that might be interesting is actually like COVID. So one thing that for me was really obvious when 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 COVID hit is just how um, how many applications there are of data science and how many more more there are. Um, for example, um, maybe another lens is also how, for example, Airbnb hires data scientists is through kind of three tracks. It's called analytics, inference, and algorithms. And when I think of when when COVID hit, there's, there were so many analytics needs, right? It's like, okay, what happened to cancellations? They're suddenly spiking. What are they gonna look like in the future? Should we measure them on the day the cancellation happens or the day of the night of the cancellation? So, so many trends that we needed to understand. And on the inference side, um, we rolled out a lot of things globally. Um, for example, the Superhost Relief Fund to help hosts. Um, these were not things that could be easy A-B tests, right? These are things you need to have, you know, sophisticated quasi-experimental methods, like some of the ones that I introduced earlier, um, to measure. And then kind of third on the algorithms lens, um, you know, a lot of things have changed dramatically. So thinking of search, people search very differently now than they did before COVID. And um, we really have to take a, you know, clean um, look at our, our models and either, you know, adjust the training window, make it shorter, reweight. Um, so it's not like things that we just built and we can just leave them. Uh, so that's just one example of like kind of the breadth that I saw just within the last few months. How do they search differently? How do they search differently? So um, I th people are very interested in, in flexibility right now, right? Um, you, you don't exactly know what's going to happen. Um, so that, that's, that, that, that's one example. Vanya's more of an expert on search than me, but that's that's one that stands out. Yeah, I mean, look, in general, I think the Airbnb search problem is very different than the search problem you see in, in other places. I'm sure in real estate search problem is, is, is even very different as well. I think in times like this, people um, sometimes search for a place within driving distance without knowing the precise location and and even dates sometimes, uh, or they search for a longer term stays where the precise date is, does not matter. And, you know, minus week or two, you know, could be accommodated if, for the right type of place. So you see the difference in these patterns and you see how people issue these queries one after another. And so what we do, we detect that and then adjust our product and our algorithms to help them achieve their goal in, in, in less queries. So Ron, you had given me a list as well. Do you want to uh, talk a little about the breadth? I mean, you talked about uh, a few problems uh, in, in your- Yeah, I, yes, oh. totally. So do you guys hear me? I switched, yes. to, switched the device yeah. here. Yeah, so like probably one thing that I wanted to mention is uh, 
um, about this article, like uh, coming kind of back to, to that question, why it looks like AI is not needed in real estate. So in commercial real estate, the world is actually kind of very, very different from the consumer side. So there are a few companies uh, that are investing a lot of money talking about like, you know, they need to build a fund of like a billion dollars to buy a portfolio of a few buildings. And those are very opinionated people. They're like, we know what's going on. And like no one will tell us because we have been there. We have looked, we, we, we you know, we've been doing that for decades, if not uh, hundreds of years. And I'm not really exaggerating because this business goes from, uh, in like, you know, in generations. So they think they know exactly what is going on. And nowadays with COVID, it's actually changing. Uh, those big organizations are getting out of the sudden scared that like, you know, things are changing and they don't understand really how it's changing. Um, like, you know, an office space in midtown Manhattan would be a very, very safe investment half a year ago. Nowadays, many of those buildings are standing empty, right? So like uh, all this is becoming uh, a big shock to the industry and everyone is trying to get as much data as possible right now to, to understand like what will happen with us. So that's why the industry is getting data driven pretty much as we speak. And the list that I, that I have here is definitely like in by no means a, a comprehensive list. It's just things that uh, we are dealing with the cherry we are focused on, and uh, uh, I think those are very important questions that we need to answer even before we get into something deeper than that. So like data cleaning, data standardization, entity resolution is something that is like the basics, right? And if we don't do it correct, then uh, like we can't just really build models. It's just totally impossible, garbage in, garbage out, right? So that's why I, I came up with a fairly short list, but a very focused list on uh, the immediate needs of the commercial real estate market. Cool. So I have a list too, but since uh, since you guys actually liked part of the one part of the question better than the other, let's keep talking about this question about why. Uh, so there's, there's, there's these sort of two pieces. One is it can't find applications, right? And the other is, uh, for um, data science, and the other is they're not finding utility out of their data scientists. Of course, those are those are um, uh, over overlapping questions. Um, Vanya was suggesting maybe they're getting run of the mill data scientists and not whatever the opposite of that is, really good data scientists, maybe right. Um, and let me let me actually offer a second perspective of that, which is maybe they're bringing in people who are too specialized, right? And so on one hand, you could have uh, data scientists who can do um, basic stuff, but actually can't do the sophisticated stuff that we need to do in real estate if we're thinking of ourselves as, as more complicated. I mean, I happen to agree with Vanya. I mean, I did a lot of work in online ads. I also worked for the phone company and did telecom. I've done data science for the banking industry, you know, and so on. Real estate is, I mean, there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges that you don't see, uh, but some of those other traditional industries also have more challenging problems than you see online. I think the, the, the online, this, this online view, right, especially with ads, gives us a false sense of the, how easy it is, um, uh, how, how, a false sense of how easy it is to, um, um, to do data science, um, and because of some of the things that were uh, uh, that have been mentioned, like you know, well, you have all these actors; they're all sitting there in your online system. You have uh, uh, actions that actually can be taken by the system. You have um, uh, outcomes that can be observed. You don't have to wait a year to see whether or not the house sells or not. You you know you get a you get an uh, you know you get an outcome right away. And something I think that is really key, which Vanya might have mentioned. So 
what are the costs and benefits involved with showing an ad or running just about any like online experiment that you read about it uh, at KDD? Let's say 90% of them, those are, you know, right? The costs and benefits are so small for any individual action, right? That you don't really have a problem if you have the same kind of problem that you make a mistake. If we go to not just to the area that I talked about, let's say the area that Ron talked about, right? You make a mistake by spending a hundred, hundred million dollars, two hundred million yeah. dollars on a business on a building, right? That's that's a you know that, that that that's a big deal. And so I think all of these things kind of come together to sort of make the problem more, make some of the problems more challenging, right? But again, that doesn't mean the lists that you guys showed me. Um, I, I unshared so that we could see us, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share again um, briefly just to illustrate, right? A, a lot of what we we do at Compass, right? It isn't have a data science solution to the problem. You're doing lots and lots and lots of different data science stuff under the hood, and then there may be a solution to the problem that is an engineered solution or a human solution or whatever that combines parts of that of that. Uh, of that data science. Um, yeah. Let me actually show my, oh, go ahead, Vanya, I think. Yeah, what I was going to say is just, you know, when I look at the list, what strikes me, you know, obviously the Airbnb list is a little bit longer, but, you know, if you look at this list, how many data scientists do you have per problem? Because if you have a, yeah, and how many people do you actually need to, to solve any of this problem to, to, to a reasonable, like, first cut solution? Uh, this will require data science teams of hundreds of people just to do justice to what we've shown on the screen here. And, and there's a lot more. And I think Cherry's list a little bit smaller because maybe the company is smaller as well, right? But, That's right. You, know, you know, this just shows that it's the opposite. It's true in terms of, yeah. you know, not being able to make use of the people um, that we have because we obviously have you know, in some cases, more problems than people. Right? Yeah. What's also interesting about the article, which I read after you sent it this morning, is that it 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 sort of talks about AI being potentially you know, a bit, bit overblown, and then it points to layoffs of, of data scientists as as evidence. But it also states that the layoffs in data science are drop drop in the bucket compared to other industries. So I feel like you could take those same facts and write a very different article, <laughs> which is like, oh, AI is still growing like crazy. Um, we are now more aware of some of the risks, like GDPR, we know that interpretability of models is important. Instead of just going deep in AI, we're also going broader and thinking about causal and interpretability. And wow, if you look at um, recent layoffs, historic layoffs, data science was much less affected. That, that would be a similar facts, different yeah. article. Right, and then to me, the 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 um, this this even this idea that oh they're not people the companies are not finding area places to use you know predictive analytics, data science, AI, whatever we want to call it, you know with you know again I put I also did just did three dozen and that was just because after you do three dozen you don't actually want to try to think up any you know <laughs> you don't want to try to find find find, find any more but um, to me let's let's actually um move on to uh the, like the next question so um you if you were if you have three dozen possibilities and as vanya said i mean each one of those needs multiple data scientists let's face it right and and by the way the you know one of the dirty secrets is that once you deploy it you need even more data scientists you know, because uh, because you know guess what it doesn't always it, it doesn't always like it never maybe works exactly the way you think it's going to work and now it's in production and you got to be able to like you know respond really fast to things so right so if in fact we need hundreds of data scientists if we want to do all this stuff and we don't have them then we have to pick and choose and I think an awful lot of companies, right? They, you know, they aren't, I mean, Airbnb is even pretty mature with respect, with respect to data science, you know, with, you know, as compared to other companies in real estate and other companies beyond, I don't think the discussion is really limited to, to real estate. Um, so it's rare to have such a, such an experienced group of, uh, of data scientists together, you know, heads of data science, multiple, two CTOs, right? You know, and so, Something that you, I have 
not read about in a machine learning or data science book. Uh, I've never seen it in a class besides my own, of course, I do teach this, but uh, um, um, you, uh, uh, most of you can't come and take my class. Um, oh. How in the world do you choose then? You each, you know, you've listed dozens of, and I have listed dozens of possible applications. We don't, I don't have hundreds of data scientists. You might, but I don't, right? How do we go about choosing which of these to work on? All right, isn't this like one of the most important things for data scientists to, 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 to be able to do? My um, one interpretation of that article is they didn't find things that had impact to work on. Maybe it's because they picked the wrong thing to work on. They also had dozens of ideas and they had to pick one. They went and they picked it and it was a stupid one to pick. <laughs> All right, Ali, you want to go first? Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is something I we think or I think about a lot and generally we think about a lot. I, I sort of separate it out into two buckets of work. There's the table stakes. There's like foundational work that everything else is built on top of and it just needs to get done. And then for everything else, I would take basically like a return on investment lens, right? Like what's the expected incremental impact? What's the ex incremental cost, whether it's um, dollars, if we're doing some you know, incentives or whether it's um, headcount, but then also what's the risk? Um, big bets might have a high impact, but they also have a, you know, there's a lot of large variance around it. And then you kind of want to make sure that you have a mix of these big boulders and pebbles and boulders will have the higher expected impact, but they're also going to, um, as I said, come with come with more variance. So um, I think an example of a like a, a big boulder that that we on the data science team at some point decided to invest in is the one I talked about earlier, which was the, the future incremental value system. That's something that beforehand it was it was risky, right? W will it will it work? Um, like it, it will all if we put this together and build the feature set, will it cover multiple applications or will, will it, we just need bespoke models? And then even if it works, will teams adopt it or will they just continue to, 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 to use their own solutions? And the, the key there is, you know, how can you de-risk a little bit? The same way you do in product development, how can you first build some kind of prototype um, before you go to the full-blown full -blown solution? Ron, you want to? Uh... Yeah, so uh, we are a startup, obviously. And uh, uh, as, as a startup, we need to be very picky about uh, what problems we are solving. So uh, the resources are sparse just because we're a startup. We are past round A. We're a fairly big company, about 50 people, but still, it's um, a it's a very difficult question to choose the right uh, data science project to work on. And we are applying a very simple uh, approach to that. Uh, we are just not going to do anything but things that our customers need. So if we see that a customer is asking something and we, our customers are usually big organizations, they know what, what they're asking. And if we see those asks being repeated by other customers, yeah, this is the project that we will do because we're seeing an immediate, uh, you know, like uh, revenue out of it. If it's not something that our customers need, we'll just push it to the, well, like, you know, next quarter or next year or something like that. So, for example, uh, there are things that our customers need and they're not getting anywhere. So, Cherry is in the data integration space, right? So, our customers are saying, we want access to this data feed and this data feed and this data feed, and we are aggregating all those data feeds together in one clean format. And one of the asks was like, do you guys have unmasked owners? Do we actually know who are those big organizations behind those uh, uh, really big landmark buildings? And we are like, hmm, there are no partners who can provide this data, but we are aggregating their their data together so we can build a system that would provide this information. So like if there is no partner who can provide this information, of course we will build it ourselves. Anya. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, honestly, uh, I've worked in companies small and big and um, and I've seen resource constraint everywhere. It's amazing. You even go in a place like Google 
and we still like nickel and diamond headcount, you know, one or two people here and there deciding what to work. So I think somehow, and that's a, you know, maybe a topic for another panel of how, how come that you scale as company, you always end up kind of dealing with very similar issues <laughs> and we thought it would be resolved forever, right? Um, I think, you know, going back, there is, there is the, you know, return on investment. And obviously if something's easy, we, we, we do it. Um, there is also uh, the things that work specifically for the domain. And what strikes me with the future incremental value and the way I learned about that from Ali and the team is that when I came in at Airbnb about a little bit over a year ago, I did not understand the domain. And I had honestly underestimated the complexity of the domain in terms of data science. And Future incremental value is a very interesting thing because it's like in the ads world, you have something called attribution. That means given that you have seen an ad, what's the likelihood of performing certain action that's favorable for the, for the company? So buying things and so on. So it's like you can make this arbitrarily complex. It's like, what is the amount of money you're going to spend on, you know, with this particular company? Now, attribution in the ad world is a mixture of data science, uh, data collection and you know black magic and honestly some self-promotion by companies like Facebook will tell you look we, we exactly know you know what's going to happen if you show ads with us so now if you if you really look from scientific point of view that you 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 could be convinced or not right so because the, the world is really really complicated um, the same thing it, it's even more maybe in some ways in Airbnb without providing temporary accommodations, but future incremental value is one of these projects that actually I think makes a lot more sense for Airbnb than uh, you know, to some extent some of these attribution methods would make for, for even for some of the ad world, right? And because the number of people coming in and the way that how people behave in sequences and so on makes it viable for us to have a workable prediction. And so the question is here, this is a very, very important project. It's like, how do you, f you fund it or you're not? You have to understand the details and understand the right level of what's feasible and what's not and divest maybe from some of the opinions you have about similar problems in other domains. Uh, because that clouds you. And, and you know, in the beginning, you're like, well, this is hard. It's like, well, maybe not, you know? So, so this, type of epiphanies at least I had when coming into this domain, which makes it fun to work here, but, but also uh, made me pause a little bit and made me maybe stop passing judgments as quickly as I was used to while living in the ads world for 15 years where you accumulate all this intuition of what could or would work versus what not. And I feel that that's, that's as a leaders in, in, in this space, that's, that's one of the key things is to assess these things. And look, between the four of us here, uh, this type of judgments of what would work and what not between the three different companies could be very different. Although we are having this panel together, our domains and the particular uh, particularities of the data are probably very, very different. Well, that's a little bit of a more philosophical answer. No, 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 yeah. No, I, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I want to go back because the, you know, you know, kind of the way I think of it actually combines a lot of what you guys have already said, and I'm not going to repeat, I'm not going to repeat it again. I want to actually pull out this notion of ROI because, um, of course, you know, we, we can kind of think. I'll put a, you know, put like a, a caricature, right? You know, of course, that's exactly what we would want to do. Like estimate the ROI. Isn't that what we ought to do with every project? And it, you know, I mean, as we, as, as all the data scientists probably know, but let's just lay, lay it out carefully, right? It turns out estimating the ROI, sort of estimating in advance, the ROI from a data science project is very different from other projects. And it's different for a particular reason, right? Um, we really have to estimate expected ROI, not just ROI. There's, and um, there are three kinds of, at least three kinds of uncertainty that we have to deal with, two of which you see a lot in other projects and one of which you don't, right? You have product uncertainty, right? Is it actually gonna be a product that the customers are gonna love? That, that happens everywhere, 
right? Mm -hmm. So that's no, that's, I mean, it, it, yeah, of course there are differences with every product, but that's not something unique to data science problems. Like there's engineering uncertainty. Are we actually gonna be able to build it with the resources we think we're gonna be able to build it with, right? Again, that happens with every project. I don't think that's particularly, I mean, it might be that our team has no experience building like fancy machine learning systems. Okay, maybe it's slightly higher, but it's no different from if you basically have some new, you know, when Hadoop came around for the first time back, you know, 15 years ago and like people were like, well, we need to use this. Yeah, there was hell of a lot of uncertainty in engineering or, you know, in engineering then, right? The, 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 the third kind of uncertainty is different, right? It's kind of like science uncertainty, right? Mm. It's basically, can you even do that in the first place, right? It's, it's not product. I'm not saying if you could do it, would, the, would somebody buy it or use it or whatever, or would it give value? No, this is a, can you even do it, you know? The first, pro, the first projects that I worked on were for the phone company, right? You know, some of those were things that I, we had seen people in other, like fraud detection. We I did, we did a lot of work on fraud detection back in the 90s, right? You had seen other people do that. So you kind of had this feeling like you could probably do it because they, they had done it in credit cards. It wasn't all that much work when I did it in, in you know, in, in telecom. But yeah, it's kind of like the same. By the way, that's a terrible way to think about it, but that's the way I thought about it. <laughs> um, you know, um, so there's this science uncertainty, you know, and Ali already talked about how we deal with that, right? We actually have to have this, we take the same kind of ideas that we do when we have product uncertainty and kind of apply them over on the science side. And it's exactly what researchers do anyway, you know. And by the way, we see humongous data science failures. Like the IBM MD Anderson $50 million debacle. I don't know if you guys uh, know about that. Go, go, go search on the web. It's not really relevant to this tutorial. But they, they lost $50 million and MIT finally did a retrospective of it. This is a healthcare thing where, where IBM was claiming this is the future of our company, right? And then, you know, and it came down to, oh, we don't have labels for the training data. Like, you didn't figure that out after a million dollars? I mean, it took you $50 million to figure that one out, right? You know, and I'm caricaturing that one too, right? You know, go read the MIT uh, 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 um, Tech Review article on it. It's very, a very good article, right? But this is kind of the idea is you have this uncertainty. How do you actually reduce that uncertainty for the lowest investment possible and then remake your decision on what your expected, expected ROI is gonna be, right? And so, um, I think that's kind of one of the keys. And so if we go through the lists, you know, we could ask ourselves, do we think we could do those things, right? Um, uh, and so on. Oh, there's another, there's another thing that I think didn't come up yet. And that is estimating the value, right? So the other part of the expected ROI is like value given success. So let's just say we could do that, right? Can we estimate the value? And I wanted to bring up something about another this isn't again unique to data science projects, but I'd like to hear your opinion on it, right? In my experience, a lot of times, much of the value that you're getting from the data science investments is actually option value, right? You, um, you build some models. They're not only useful for that problem that you're working on, but you could then apply them to a bunch of other things. You get the data in order. It's a big investment the first time you get the data in order. Once it's in order, you can apply it to a bunch of other things, right? You actually, your data scientists learn the domain better. They learn the data better. Like there's all this optionality you're investing in, right? And some projects have much higher option value than others, right? And so you guys actually kind of explicitly take this into account when you're picking projects. And this one might have less direct value, but a lot more option value. And so therefore we're gonna sort of put put a bunch of investment in that? I have to smile right. because I remember sitting in a meeting with Vanya and Vanya asked, what's the future incremental value of the future incremental value? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good. Should I jump in? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, yeah, so like it, it, obviously as data scientists, we talk a lot uh, with engineering teams. And for them, all those questions are so much not trivial. I mean, like the first thing that they ask me usually when, when I'm talking about a new project, they're like, okay, when is it going to be ready? How much time it will take you to, to build it? And I'm like, um, uh, if it works, 
it's uh, like to them, you build the project, you have like a timeline, you start, you, you do it, you build it. In our domain is like, you need to figure out what is working, how is it working, and they just, they don't think in those, that, that terms. So it's a, a constant clash between data science and engineering, because for engineering, everything has to be, you know, planned and measured. For us, there is so much uncertainty that you talked about that, like, you know, before we come up with something, we, we really need to play with it. And the trouble is that uh, when the conversation goes directly between data science and data engineering, there is like a gap in understanding. So whatever I'm trying to explain, the engineers just don't, don't get. They're like, okay, when is the deadline? When are you doing it? So the right approach for solving that is actually involving the, the management. Like in our case, that's the CEO. We're actually sitting in, in the, all those meetings and, and he's, he's watching the dynamics. Like when I'm trying to explain to the engineering guys, we need to research this. Like, you know, it's not that like there is a lot of uncertainty in the project like that and they stop understanding me, then the person on top is connecting all this together and saying, yes, like data science is just thinking differently, engineering is thinking differently, why don't we find a way to combine it together such that it's gonna be the mutual benefit both for engineering and product and data science and the entire company. So this dynamics is very interesting and I'm very like, you know, lucky to be in a company when, when it's happening exactly to everyone's benefit. I'm pretty sure that other companies might suffer in this domain. So data science is, is, is I mean, maybe, maybe the name <laughs> has, has some alignment here, uh, you know, is much more like R&D than it is like sort of traditional engineering, especially in the early stages. My, um, the company that Compass bought, my, comp my company, um, mine and Panos's and Josh's company that, that, um, that uh, Compass bought, um, one of our lines of work was actually advising stakeholders on their data science strategy, getting things in order, picking the right projects, stuff like that, right? And one of the things that, 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 I, that I learned very early on was, even though data science is much more like R&D, keep your mouth shut about it. Because as soon as you mention research or R&D or whatever, most of those stakeholders are like, they had some bad experience with R&D or research at some point, right? And they're like, yeah, get the hell out of here if that's what you're talking about, that R&D stuff, right? You know, and so I think we need to talk about the characteristics of those problems, you know, rather than talk about is, oh, we have to do the research first, right? Then it seems like you're gonna go off and like, you know, write some KDD papers or something and, you know, never come back with anything, anything useful. Yeah, I mean, I, I would turn this around on you, Foster, you know, since, although you're the moderator, but let's turn, turn this around on you a little bit, you know, uh, as a recovering researcher myself, you know, you, you're still a researcher, right? I mean, you're still at an academic institution, but I, I've, I've shedded away that part of my uh, <laughs> professional persona. So as a recovering researcher, when do you think and how would you advise those companies uh, when R&D is actually appropriate? Like, when do you yeah. push the envelope out versus you stay in the comfort zone? And how do you balance that thing? Right, I mean, so very I, selfishly because we have this problem in Airbnb right. too, you know. So. Right, and you know, I mean, uh, uh, people maybe don't know. I've also been, I've also established, you know, sort of been the like data science founder for several other startups that you know where we had to deal with these questions, and I think different companies deal with them, we deal with them differently, and so it has to do a lot with strategy. And so let me talk a little about that. Um, so I think this with when it comes to data science, there, there's we could take companies and put them into three buckets where the strategic issues with respect to data science differ in the three different buckets, right? The first one, let's call them type A companies from a data science perspective, type A companies. Those are companies for which the data science is like their fundamental raison d'etre, right? They, they, they would not exist without the data science, right? You know, um, the company that, um, uh, I helped to found Distillery, uh, which is an online advertising company. It does machine learning based 
uh, audience creation, targeting, stuff like that. Without data science, it wouldn't exist. That's just, you know. Um, same with uh, another company that I helped to found, Integral Ad Science. Integral Ad Science, you know, again, it's fundamentally based upon doing data science and then making products based on data science and so on, right? You know, so that's for category A. Category C are companies where data science really has nothing to do with their strategy, mm -hmm. right? You know, so when I worked for the phone company, I worked for what's now Verizon. Look, they're going to be delivering telephone service, wireless service, television service, whether or not they have any data science, right? It's a very different situation there. Then you still, you still have to think about what's the strategy of the company, right? And then align the data science with what the strategy of the company is. So if the company is trying to be the low cost provider, then you should be applying your, your, your data science towards, um, I'll get the, the question, but I think this, this carving up is, is important. You, can, you apply your, 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 your data science towards reducing costs. If you want to be a, the best customer service and charge a premium for it, then you apply your data science to improving your customer service. Whatever the strategy of the company is, you want your data science strategy to be aligned. And then in between those two are companies, um, let me think, Airbnb, I believe would be one of these companies. It's a company for which data, uh, the, the, the data science actually isn't necessary as a fundamental thing. You could still match you know, let's just say the, the, the technology, you can still, you can build a tech solution to match homeowners, uh, uh, homeowners who want to rent out, out their properties with guests without um, substantial data science, right? But you're thinking that you're competing based on data science, right? The data science is part of your strategy to compete. And so Amazon in retail would have clearly been a company like this, Airbnb, I think, and, and I think Compass is also in this, uh, in this realm, uh, Cherry might actually be in the first class where the data science is, a fund is part of the fundamental reason for being. Like, we're a brokerage, right? We want to compete based upon our, you know, up on our tech platform and then the data science as being a fundamental part of competition, right? Okay, so where does the R, when, when do you want to do R&D? Ah, this is very different. Probably if in your, ca in category C, you're probably not going to be doing much R&D at all. You're applying this stuff you may be getting consultants, you have data science, are they going out of their way to sort of research stuff, not beyond the R&D that's just necessary to do the stuff we talked about before. See whether this stuff is gonna work for the application. See whether we can build something that's gonna be an option to do other things in the future, right? Type A companies, my view is they wanna start doing R&D from the beginning, right? They want to, I mean, this, this is everything that they're basing the company on. They want to do as much research on that stuff as they can. Like distillery, we published, I'll bet you we published more KDD papers per employee in the company of any company ever. Wow. I'll make that bet. We published more KDD papers per company, uh, per, com per employee than any, co than any uh, uh, company ever, right? Why? Well, because this is our fundamental reason for being. We wanted, you go to Google and we wanted them to say, yeah, that's one of the smartest companies around and when it comes to data science. Yeah, bring, you know, bring them in and talk to them. Whether we're going to buy from them is a different story, but bring them in, we want to talk to them, right? And then in the middle, if you're going to be competing, if you, you know, you're going to be Airbnb and you're going to be competing on this stuff, I think you choose those bets wisely. Where is some research that's really aligned with your fundamental strategy? Yeah, and go off and, you know, I mean, you know, I want to, like, like for instance, we're writing these, uh, for people who joined uh, 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 late, right? Um, we have a blog uh, series that we've just started. It's, uh, you can go to um, something like AI at Compass or something like that, but it's on Medium, you'll find it, uh, follow it. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna be publishing we start off with the AI at the product level and then have subs have us, you know, try to make these bite-sized pieces and have pieces that go deeper and deeper into the science, right? Because we're not ready to be writing scientific papers. We're kind of too early to be doing that, right? But we still want to be kind of doing talking about our research, right? Because this is, you know, this is this is this because we're in that middle, we're in that middle crew. So I think it's I think it's yeah, when you start to actually believe that this is kind of a fundamental thing we're going to compete on. Then you want to start doing R and D on it, and basically make sure you know more than anybody in the world about it. Not just we can figure out what how the product works. There's also an interesting not to go too much on a tangent, but there's also an interesting org design question at that point, right? Like it's interesting to see how different companies solve 
the R and D question. Is it, does it happen embedded in the individual teams that are thinking about that specific topic, say pricing, or do you pull out the, a team, the people who go deeper and think more longer term about the, and, and publish more papers into its own team. And you see a lot of different companies, you know, choose different paths there. Yeah. Yeah. I have opinion on that, but I probably have opinion on everything. I mean, I've seen both of the extremes fail. At one extreme, you have this over the wall thing where you have these scientists and they write papers and then like, you know, somehow or other their stuff is supposed to actually have an impact in practice. And if you have a heroic person who really wants to have an impact in practice, it can work, but it's just not, I don't think it, I haven't seen it sort of systematically work. And then the other side, you have complete embedding and that doesn't work either because guess what? The, it, it, the fires to fight, <laughs> there's always fires to fight it's this, you, you, you can always put off the stuff you need to do to get a paper written, right? And so papers just don't get written. The research just doesn't get done well, you know? And so you have to have, find some middle ground where the people are still embedded yet, you know, however you manage it is another story, but let's just say, yeah, half your sprint time is actually spent on doing the science and you're gonna be actually incentivized and evaluated based on it. It's not mm -hmm. like something you could put aside because then you won't be actually doing your job. Right, so something in the middle there is, to me, is, is what seems to work. And I love just a lot of celebration and incentivizing of the stuff that you actually wanna see happening, which is just, I guess, management 101 kind of stuff. Vanya, yeah, what do you say about that? Uh, I, I think as one of my early managers when I was at IBM Research, for, for that matter, a long time back, he always says this, different ways you can skin a cat, right? So it's an old saying in the West, I guess. And uh, I, I think you can, you know, it, the, the research model question is, is a forum of itself, but you know, you need to make sure your incentives are aligned correctly because I've seen this, for example, in IBM research, it was, you know, funding model was at some point you do whatever you want. And then the funding model was, no, you have to get some funding from the product teams. And I've seen how it neither worked or both helped solve something. And then the moment you, 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 you change the system, people just find a way to do what need to do. Uh, <laughs> which, which brings me to the other point that I'm a little bit pivoting, maybe the conversation, um, Foster. Um, I, I, I think one of the things with a real estate domain per se is how much economics it has in it. And, you know, this is where, people like Ali come in, um, you know, I think we at Airbnb, we probably have a top tier economics department in terms of, you know, how many econo people with economics background we have. And I feel that I've, I, I work with top tier economists on the ad side as well, but again, uh, there a click on an ad is so inconsequential in, in the overall scheme of life that economics is, is a lot, less prominent. And I think some of the mistakes we made in the early days at Yahoo and Google was that we didn't take economics in account and then we messed up things because the problem with economics is you mess it up. You figure out two years from now when it's too late, right? <laughs> and so <clears throat> I, I wanted to see Ali maybe hear from you and then hear from both of you as well. It's like, what's kind of the coupling here of economics and data science, which I think is very unique for this domain. So before Ali comes in, I just want to make a clarification because I think I brought this up before. So I just want to clarify, right? The individual decisions in advertising uh, have much lower costs and benefits. Right. But there's a billion of them a day for this okay. company and a billion That's of them a day for that company. And so what, yes. it, but what it allows you to do is run experiments at scale. Yes, yes. And the reason- so It's not really that the decisions are low overall low value it's like individual decisions are low value and that allows you to do different things okay yeah so the bucket the bucket you, you reason on some bucket level but you know and 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 somehow things a lot more similar at that at that ground line. all right ali oh sure yeah um so respect to economics i think where it can be very helpful is when you're thinking about how to design a marketplace right you don't have a large training data necessarily to go back on with lots of counterfactual worlds of how to design. So take something like Airbnb, one of the things we think about is like our cancellation policies. 
we can't look at thousands and thousands of um, companies' histories who tried different cancellation policies and see what happened, right? So you kind of have to, to a certain extent, use some economic theory. Like if you give more flexibility, people will probably book more, they'll probably cancel more. There might be an inventory holding problem. You, wa you want to think through all of those before you, when you're designing your, when you're designing your marketplace. And uh, once you have designed it, I think that's when you, when you're optimizing your marketplace, that's when I think um, ML AI is, is particularly useful, right? So let's, going back to the cancellation policy example, you could imagine showing different cancellation policies to different guests or different hosts. Um, but it's, it's hard to start out the problem or problems like that um, with pure, a pure prediction um, methodology. Right. Uh, for Cherry, it's uh, still different, but uh, very kind of interesting. Our customers are economists. Like they, when they want to invest like $200 million in the portfolio of buildings, they actually operate in all these economic, uh, economics uh, toolkit that is built to make this type of a decision because I'm pretty sure that like if you give me two hundred million dollars to invest, my hands will be shaking. Like it's not an easy decision to make. So we as a data company, we are talking a different language. We are talking the language of like why don't we take data, we merge it, we'll build the model, we'll let the, the data talk. They are speaking in terms of macroeconomics, microeconomics, and how do you analyze whatever you have in order to make the decision. So that's definitely a, a disconnect between whatever we used to build, because you know we've been building products for decades on the data science side in different other industries, and the market that is actually looking for something else, it really looks like it's, it's looking for something else. So this is not a trivial problem to solve, but the markets are kind of coming closer to each other. So those investors who've been thinking about like, you know, macroeconomic factors that affect their decisions, out of the sudden they understand that there is a layer of big data that they haven't touched because they thought that it's not what they need, out of the sudden they look at others who are already using technology like that and getting better investments and they're like, ha, huh, wow, we need to do something about it. So they are willing to speak to us our language. The question is whether we are willing to speak to them their language. And to do that, we actually need to have a lot of domain knowledge. We actually really need to understand real estate to speak to them. This is not trivial for us because all of us are coming from other domains and we, we learn them, we forgot them, we probably relearn them and stuff like that. Real estate is fairly new for pretty much all of us. And before we learn that domain, before we understand why they are doing it as they are doing it, it's going to be hard for us to actually, like you know, reduce this gap to total minimum. So we should all take uh, Foster's class here, right? Totally. So, um, yeah, I mean, at Compass, we actually have yet another because you know Airbnb is has has created a new market and a new kind of you know a new kind of market. I mean, um, um, yeah, and. Uh, Cherry is actually serving a particular, you know, a particular market, and um, Compass actually is serving an extremely complicated market, right? When we think about, oh, you know, so I mean, I, I think of like um, when people talk. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, bring in something that Ali was talking about before, right? When people talk about Facebook as a as a two sided as a two sided market, no, it's not, right? Facebook is a retailer. Facebook invests in merchandise, which is the people who are on Facebook, and it sells them to, it is exactly Walmart for people's attention. It's not a two-sided market. 
there's not people who are looking for looking for ads and then they're going to pay for it if only they can find the right company to advertise to them right it's not a two-sided market right it's just amazon you know for not amazon marketplace which is a two-sided market amazon you know selling something to someone who wants to pay for it and then how they have the inventory problem with their inventory is keeping their people on facebook and they're keeping the attention on there right Okay. That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. We have our two-sided markets, right? Where we have Uber and like the ones that Ali was talking about, Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and others as well. Amazon Marketplace, there's others as well, right? Think about actually the market that Compass is playing in. Is it a two-sided market? No. Is it a three-sided? It's more than that. Is it a three-sided market? No, it's actually more than that, right? What are the sides? Well, of course you think they're the buyers and the sellers of homes. Okay. But, the buy, but there's also prospective buyers and sellers, right? And let's forget about prospective buyers because it's interesting. It's hard to tell the difference between a prospective buyer and a buyer. So we'll just call them a buyer, right? But a seller changes completely once they list their home. Everything about what their economic setup is changes when they list the home, right? And before that, by and large, they're in the market for an agent, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a matching problem of matching agents to prospective sellers, right? right? And so you have agents, you have prospective sellers. Then once the actually agent and the seller get together, it's a different entity. This is actually a seller with a listed home, a seller in the market. Right? Now you have the problem of matching a seller to a buyer, right? And then of course, on the buyer side, you still have people who, you th who the agents think are buyers, but they're not, they're tourists. <laughs> you know, there's plenty of people, and not anymore, but there's plenty of people who go to open houses as a, as a hobby and love to chat with agents about things, right? You know, who aren't really serious, serious buyers, right? You know, um, and so forth. We can actually expand this out. So it's this really complicated market. And the nice thing is, from the point of view of the original question, like, do you need these? We don't need economists to help us design that. That's just there. We may need economic thinking to help us understand it, we may want to have economics on staff to help us understand it. At some point, we may want to change the dynamics of it. So we would need e e economists for that. But at a first stage, we are in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the game of how do we make our agents the most productive agents in the world, in the country, we're only a national right now, um, given that market. So, so let me let me challenge you, uh, not on the company, uh, on Compass as a company. I think Compass as a company is doing probably the, the right thing here, but a little bit wider in the real estate market. The economic model that I see in the real estate market is defined, is extremely conservative model, simply because the goods are so expensive, right? But you could potentially design a completely different economic models of ownership and people are trying some people yes. are trying you can live in the house and still somebody else can own portions of it you know it's like you know in, in the way of i'm gonna pour all my money into this home and then own it and live in it it's a you know compared to the stock market compared to other ownership models where because people don't just live in homes they more and more increasingly People see them as investments, as investment vehicles and so on. Right. So you could design an economic model that will be significantly different. Now, the problem is that everything from construction to selling homes is extremely conservative. Like the technology that was built, that, that built this house where I am here is probably around for 50 years and people build them the same way because if you build it a different way, people might not buy it, right? But you could design an economic model that's different. Yeah. Somebody oh, yeah, will. Yeah. Somebody yeah, will. Uh, just to go to the other extreme, and Ron heard me talk about this, or anybody, because I was reading this book and I was so fascinated about it. it was, it's, it's called Radical Markets. You could, you could imagine this is sort of the future that potentially Vanya is laying out if you go to the extreme, a world where um, you, like ownership is completely, like doesn't exist the way it does today. And everything, especially real estate, is for sale always. So imagine like I want to build a supersonic train and I look on my app, let's say it's Cherry, it's kind of the future of Cherry as well. And I can see, okay, I need these parcels and I can just click and buy those parcels, right? Because if I own something, I have to say it costs this much, I pay property taxes on it. And 
um, anybody can buy it at any time, right? That's like one of the futures that, that people are exploring where you take kind of the auction model to the extreme. Airbnb is almost like one step in that direction of like, um, you, you, you own your place, but you're also renting out to someone else. This would kind of be the, the designing uh, the radical market as they, as they call it. Yeah, and I think, by the way, I don't disagree with the fact that there's other uh, um, designs of the market. And so my point was, this is Compass's strategy, right? Yeah. You know, Compass's strategy is to particularly um, optimize the existing, traditional existing market. There's other markets, right? I mean, we already have some of these things. I mean, Airbnb has gone a long way already towards you know, sort of t taking this part of the world. But we have other examples as well, right? The, the iBuyers, which unfortunately COVID, you know, COVID was the risk that people were warning for, for, for the iBuyer model. For those of you who don't know, the iBuyer are, are systems that where, where, the, where the, a company just buys homes and then worries about selling them later. And that's helpful for, uh, uh, for people who don't want the hassle of having to sell their house or they want to buy another one. They need the capital from the sale of their house in order to put the down payment on the, on the, you know, on the new house. There's various situations where this is a, a, a viable thing. I'm not going to talk much about iBuyers, but this is another option for a kind of an instant marketplace for selling your home. There's another question about how, do they, how the world do they end up selling all those homes and, uh, and a big, of course, the risk because it's a huge capital investment that you need, right? But there's others as well. I mean, timeshares have been around forever and timeshares are kind of like a peak, a poor peak <laughs> at that future, right? You know, I mean, people who, who, who own a property and they own a share of the property and then they get some fractional use of the property, right? I happen to own, um, I own two homes, um, one that I can't go to now because it's in Southern France and I'm not allowed to go. Uh, but that would be a home that I, that would be an option to like Airbnb it. Right. Turns out I'm not a huge fan of that just because I don't like people in my house, but, uh, but um, that's a perfect option for that. But my other place is actually a co-op. Right. For those of you who don't live in New York, you may never have heard of a co-op. What do we do? We as the co-op board, it's a company that owns the building essentially. And then we have shares in the company which then allow us to live in our apartments, right? And so again, it's just another piece of these. And these are all like kind of lame, lame versions of that future that kind of have, have, um, have like worked in little niches, right? Yeah, yeah. You know. We'll talk to you about the home you have in France and we'll get it listed as, you know, after right after this tutorial, if anybody's interested, <laughs> I'll send the link out. <laughs> In the meantime, yeah. <laughs> and France, yeah, guys, wants, France wants you to pay all sorts of crazy taxes if I just rent it out a few weeks a year to people. <laughs> I think that this economy might actually uh, become a reality soon, but there, there is one prerequisite for that. He is uh, the democratization of the knowledge. When you know what you're investing in, then uh, like, you know, you can invest in many other things like that. In real estate, you just don't have that knowledge. You really need to do a lot of research, a lot of legwork to actually kind of be sure in whatever you're investing. So it might work if you want to buy a house and rent it out. But if you want to be part of like, you know, a hundred houses or a thousand houses that are all rented, um, it would be very risky because you have no idea what you're investing in. So there is a model of REITs, for example. Those are uh, publicly uh, traded companies that own real estate. So you can invest in a REIT and it just be on the, like, you know, on the stock market pretty much. The problem is that you don't even, as an investor in a REIT, you don't really know what they own and uh, how, how well their real estate is doing. They are not, even being a publicly traded company, they, they're not obligated to release this type of information. So you're again in the, in the void. You just don't know for sure what you're doing. If this knowledge becomes available for masses, for people, then out of the sudden people are going to be much freer in making real estate investments. I'll like, you know, I'll, I'll own 2% of this house and 3% of that house something like that, but we need to have this knowledge available.
as this well, knowledge way, becomes, oh, go ahead, Ollie. As this knowledge becomes more available, I'm just curious, Fasha, this is for you. Um, what about the six percent commission? I feel like as this data becomes, you know, more and more uh, yeah. democratized. Right. Um, so, I mean, I've seen some directions of Redfin and whatnot to to. Are you in the market, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> I was, but I saw <laughs> not anymore. Decided not to. <laughs> right. So, um, first of all, I think we're in the residential real estate. We're already seeing some of this. I mean, Zillow. Um, you know, Zillow's a pioneer with putting data out there that wasn't available before, for example, estimations of the value of homes, right? You know, um, you know, agents hate that. <laughs> um, but agents hate that. Really well. Those estimations are not really good. Honestly. I'm not going to make a call on whether Zillow's estimations are good or not. Ron can tell us that they're not, but I'm not gonna make a call on that. Um, you know, but the thing is, is that let's just say that they're, they're as good as can be done. The fact is, is that they're estimations. There's gonna be some distribution of errors around the, around the estimates. And so what are the agents, even if they were pretty good, right? And I'm not saying they're not, even if they were, some of them are gonna be erroneous. Right. And the problem is, is the pricing discussion is now anchored from what's seen on Zillow. Right. You know, and so it's a lot more work now. The, the kind of thing that I was talking about in my session earlier, this, these comps analysis and stuff are, are actually much more critical now. Right. Because people are anchored for whatever Zillow happened, Zillow's models happen to give, you know, as the, as the estimate. Right. And um, yeah. But on the other hand, Previously, you didn't know anything. You had to talk to your neighbors about where, you know, who sold their house. Oh, the person sold their house down the street. But that house isn't anything like ours. Yeah, but they got whatever for it or something like that. So we're already seeing the sort of democratization of, in this case, of inferences and of data because it used to be only the agents could search the MLSs and find out the, the, even what houses were out there. Right now, you have Zillow's site, you have Compass's site, you have Redfin's site, you have Street Easy in New York, which is a Zillow site, right? You know, and you can find out all manner of stuff, you know. And so, to the question on six percent commissions, I don't know. Uh, I just um, was working this past week with my mom. I think I mentioned this earlier. She's selling my uncle's house who died earlier this year, um, and so. Um, I don't know if you all know, houses, homes are essentially free in Pittsburgh. Um, and so my mother, my mother lives south of, uh, in, south, in southwestern Pennsylvania, south of Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, you just go there and they give you homes. It's, it's amazing. Um, so seriously, that, so my uncle has this really very nice um, home. It's, it's, it's kind of unique because it has a garage, but then it has a truck garage. And so being in like Southwestern Pennsylvania and having a separate truck or super high with the super high ceilings with an exhaust fan in it. So, you know, cool house, you know, um, on the market for 150 grand. Right. And so I went and I'm like, you know, should she be negotiating the, you know, the commission with her agent? And then I'm like, you know, Agents getting 4,500 bucks out of this thing, you know, I mean, look at all this work she's going to actually do, you know, you know, for my mom, you know, uh, so my feeling is that, um, and by the way, and if it gets to be like, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, high end in New York, again, the agents do a tremendous amount of work, because you have a lot of um, unique properties, uh, and unique uh, buyers. Right. And so at least at the ends of the spectrum, it seems to me like, you know, the agents are earning something, whether the amount that I, I, my feeling was in Pittsburgh, that the amount that she's earning for doing this seemed appropriate for the amount of work that she was doing. Right. Yeah. Um, and so if that's the case, you know, maybe, maybe agents become Uber drivers and actually just don't earn what they really ought to be earning. <laughs> um, but um, uh We'll see. I don't think it's happening in the next five years. <laughs> you know, we, we went and we were in the market 20 years back with my wife and, you, you know, being kind of new in the, the U.S., you know, just culturally, this, this tax of 6% just felt amazingly high, honestly. And so, you know, so that, that, that kind of, but even at that time, you know, with the internet coming up and, and, and the internet had this multiple promises in, in many different domains that turned to be the opposite, right? I mean, 
um, I, I thought that agents will be gone within five years in 2000. I also thought that uh, mystery will be gone from the world because the truth will propagate through this medium very quickly, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I think to some extent, I think what's happening, or this is a hypothesis, what might be happening is with all this information and data being available, you actually have bigger need for somebody to curate and help you through it yeah. than, than you had before when you had no virtual data, you need somebody to help you with no data. So maybe the agents are solving a different type of a problem than, than, right. than, 20, than, than 20 years back. Um, and, and, and that's why they're still relevant. Um, I will just mention one thing. I think one of the things that I, again, as a learning experience at the Airbnb, I never understood the difficulty of dealing with properties is that they're not fungible. They're very different. It's like, even for Airbnb, some people need a pool and others and, and would not take a property without a pool, for example, especially now if you're sitting at home and in the house with small children and you, and you need, you know, some kind of a entertainment. And so yeah, houses without a pool are just not, you know, apply to you. And I think the, the key for any analysis of supply is really, really hard because there's some very specific preferences on the consumer side that it's just impossible to factor in out and say, hey, we need more supply in this area because it's really, really hard to, to, to deal with such a heterogeneous supply. And let me actually point something out that, that comes up from that comment. So um, in part because of this and also, and secondly, because the decision is made so infrequently for most residential home buyers, right? Um, but I think also in the Airbnb case as well, we have a, this, a, the following phenomenon. So people, I've seen lots of people come into real estate and they're like, ah, well, the search problem. I know about search problems. I worked at Google or I worked at Amazon, right? And people are searching all the time and we do all this AI and we help, you know, the thing is, is that although we call it search, that's not what it is, right? You know, it's a, a pro for most people, it's a process of exploration and discovery that is facilitated by a thing that looks like a search engine, right? But it's not that you go in with an information, a specific information need, or you go in with a specific product that you're going to look for, at least product need. And I'm going to compare several different razors because obviously I don't have one, you know, and I want to find the one that's right, that's right, that's right for me, right? No. You know, I think it's, I, I'm betting, because I don't know Airbnb so much, I'm betting finding the right vacation home for you and like finding the right house for you are very similar, whereas you go in and part of what you're doing is, 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 is engaging in a process of self-discovery. Yep. Like, what would I really like? Where would I really like, you know, I'm, I'm, I need to move for my job, you know, to Seattle, you know? Yeah, I've been there. My sister used to live there. My brother used to live there. But I don't have any idea where in Seattle I would want to live. How could I possibly know that? Yep. Right. So I have to sort of engage in a process of discovery, you know, and agents, the buyer's agents helped people with that. Right. They talked about all the different things. They talked to you about what's, what's important to you is commuting is, you know, public transportation, is having coffee shops, is, you know, you have hobbies, you go to the gym, you have a dog, you know, you have to visit your in-laws, you know, what are all the things that are important to you? And I'll help you to figure that out, right? And so this is all stuff, I think, that once we get the data into systems, we can build intelligent agents, you know? Um, and so in the long run, it may be that a lot of the Fun, you know, agents functionality is going to is going to change but um i'm kind of with vanya on yeah we kind of thought that we were going to be able to reach <laughs> all this information technology was going to get us to the truth more efficiently as well so <laughs> yeah there's two things that are come to mind one is just like interesting juxtaposition between that not happening in real estate but it happening quite a bit in finance I, and i think we're getting at you know what the what some of the differences are the other thing that I was just thinking about when you were talking about um, search, I think one thing that's that's interesting with real estate is also do you take the perspective of are you optimizing for um, you know your one client or your one guest or for the marketplace as a whole, right? Because getting back to the original point, 
that I made earlier, um, once a house or a listing or a piece of real estate is off the market, it, it's not there anymore and you can't give it to someone else. So there's some really interesting like efficiency allocation questions of how to, how to match best. Yeah, so as Vanya wrote in the chat, uh, uh, we are uh, got about 15 minutes left. Uh, audience, you have uh, two T's. I don't know how much you're getting tutored. You're the audience. What, uh, you have uh, questions that you want to raise? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there is one. The first question is, um, ah, one's up, yeah. Um, you know, on the intersection of DS and economics, I've been thinking about the scrutiny that the big tech is getting from Congress. There are implications for DS leadership about types of projects we invest in. How is your work calculation impact in staffing data, data science and competitive pricing? So this is a this is a very, very good question. And I think, look, companies like Airbnb and Compass and Cherry is, um, and to some extent, much more connected to the real world again than the traditional internet company. I mean, there, there is, there is there as well, and, and, and companies as they grow and become bigger, they impact the world as like a gravity pool, and you change it in the way that sometimes you don't intend to. And so every company that, that, that starts growing like that has to decide on the amount and, 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 and the moral compass of the company, so to say, and how to complement the business activities with that moral compass. And so I think, you know, Google had do no evil and, you know, other companies had other kind of ways that Airbnb is, we call it being a 21st century company. And this has a set of principles that first we believe that we serve not only the company, the employees, the shareholders, but what we call a community is a much wider, including the communities where these homes are and the communities of the people who are traveling. So we assume that our goal is to first, you know, to improve the lives of a much, much wider scope, which basically encompasses the world's population. And so um, this type of questions come honestly on a regular basis. And on a regular basis, we need to understand the impact of a company in individual communities. And we strive to get better and better in this. And we have invested significant data science resources into this and then counter some of the potentially negative effects that we have. So it's a great question. It's, it's, it's something that's, uh, that's a daily basis for us in terms of understanding and, and making sure that we do good in the world. I can add just two quick observations. One, um, because we're a, because real estate, you know, is a bit late as compared to finance and telecom and advertising and so on to the like broad use of machine learning and other data science methods, we do get the ad advantage of seeing the mistakes that have been made. We have learnings on like transparency and fairness and, you know, other ethical issues of, of modeling that we can actually start to draw on. And the second is, we also are already bound by various uh, business ethics uh, principles like fair housing and so on, right? And so we're also starting off in a position where we already have to think about that, even if we hadn't had the lessons from, uh, you know, from, from, from other companies. I'm not saying that means every real estate data science company is like the most ethical company in the world. I don't know about what every real estate company is, is, is doing, but I think there are these threads that actually give the give some building blocks, right? So hopefully we uh, if we're going to make mistakes, we make new ones, not the same ones over again. There's another question uh, from Michael, which is is uh, uh, maybe Ron knows about this. Yeah. Is automated valuation used in financial analysis, or is it more to support an investment decision? Yeah, that's an interesting question, especially in the commercial real estate domain. So there are two aspects of a commercial real estate investor uh, that uh, one is uh, acquisitions usually, and another one is asset management. So they actually need to understand how well their assets are doing. And that's a constant, uh, like, you know, monitoring, and they, you, they cannot just, like, leave their portfolio and just hope that this portfolio is going to be making money. 
that's not never happening. So if they are constantly involved in this financial analysis of, of their own portfolio, and obviously the changes in the price that can happen independently on how well they're managing their portfolio. It can be some change that happened to the neighborhood or some macroeconomic change that, uh, that is happening right now, for example. Asset management has to, be take, has to take all those factors into account. And obviously, uh, uh, like uh, valuations are being used in this domain. But honestly, there is, again, a very big opportunity here that it's not done uh, well from the data science perspective. So those are analysts that are sitting with spreadsheets and try to analyze what they have on their spreadsheets. Uh, I mean, it's uh, valuable, but it's not enough. And uh, uh, it's an opportunity for us, uh, for data scientists to jump in and help investors with their asset management. All right, any other questions? Anybody wants to do a life and sound question? Uh, yeah, I would love to ask an, a question. I just want to check that you guys can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Rohan. I've been asking the questions in the chat, but uh, I figured out that my mic works. Um, I it's just, So this question may be misguided because I'm not super familiar with real estate. I'm just like a data scientist who would also like to own a house eventually. And uh, I think this conversation has been awesome and delivered on much more. Uh, but it seems like there's a theme of kind of like information asymmetry. I, I think that's one of the things that uh, you touched on in this panel. Um, but then at the same time as data scientists, like we, we always have these kind of idealized data sets in our mind and like we want tons of information so that we can somehow model all of it and then establish these great connections, uh, maybe in terms of pricing or something else. Um, could you talk a bit more about like the, the information that I guess you don't have access to that you wish you did and, and how you're, how you're solving for that and how it impacts what you can do with data science in real estate? I can certainly, uh, speak about that. I mean, for, um, you know, for modeling, who's likely to sell which um, um, again, we can talk, I don't have time to really talk about all the applications. You can read about them. Um, but well, the drivers of, uh, of, of selling are largely things that we don't really observe. Um, you might be able to do things like go out and, you know, crawl LinkedIn and stuff like that and find out whether people change jobs, where, you know, crawl Facebook, see whether people seem to have gotten a divorce, right? All these different things that, you know, um, and so what do you, so, um, uh, you can buy third-party data that actually get, gets at some of these at some of these things. Um, you can, uh, and then the, the the from the machine learning point of view, which is actually one of the things that really fascinates me, is you know there's this idea, this this phenomenon that has struck me over and over again, and it still strikes me even though I've been doing this for 30 years, and that is the AI models that come out of the machine learning they don't think the way people do. Right. If there's some way to proxy for something and you got, you know, good enough, you know, reasonable training data, you know, they'll figure they'll figure it out. So, you know, the agent will want to basically say, well, we don't know whether or not that person actually had a kid. And so I, I don't believe that, you know, whether they're likely to sell their house. Right. And the machine learning model says, well, in that neighborhood, people actually live in their houses for five years. And then by and large, they go and they move out to a better school district. <laughs> so they buy it. It's small houses. They buy it when they're a young family. They have kids. They live there. And if you buy and large after five years. And so we're just estimating the likelihood of things. Right. Guess what? We can do that. And so I think a lot there's a lot of this. What can proxy for what? And of course, we try to get more and more data all the time, but you also have to be thinking about what can proxy for, for what. Same thing with like valuation. You know, you may not know some really super cool aspect of a home that increases its value, but you can go back to its prior transactions and see how its value in all its prior transactions stacked up against what you would have expected it to be at that time 
and possibly infer there must be something. I don't know what it is, but there must be something about that house because every time it's sold, it's sold for more than what you would expect a house with those features to actually sell for. And so this is like, again, another one of these things. Like if we're doing estimations, let's embrace the fact that they're estimations, right? You know, and not feel like we have to know everything perfectly in order to make an estimation. No, you know, we, you know, dig into that. So that's kind of my two cents on the matter. Yeah, building on that example, Airbnb would be we um, give, give price suggestions to hosts, right? And so um, ideally we would know if they price differently, what would happen? But we don't actually observe all those counterfactuals. That, that would be something that ideally we would know if you set this price, what happens? If you set this price, what happens? If you set that price, what happens? So it's, um, it's inferring, it's proxying, it's looking at other listings, um, very much what, what Foster talked about. In the commercial sector, it's even uh, funnier. Uh, the data is available in uh, big quantities, all types of data. The trouble is that it's uh, like uh, 50 different vendors and all of them are providing data in, in different formats. And before we integrate them together, like a customer just cannot understand what is going on. And even more so, the customer gets kind of tired and like uh, now i need to look at this data and that data and this data and that data and this so they're just making a decision and uh, since the decision is not made based on the full picture they actually are losing a lot of money like and we are talking about millions and millions of dollars so this is something that we need to change even despite the fact that the investors and the owners don't really want to look into that data. They're too tired. They're not really technical. We don't want them to lose money only based on the fact that they didn't want to look at this data. So we need to build a model that is helping for them to do the right, uh, to make the right choice, even despite the fact that they are not technical enough to process all those data sets. So this is what we are doing here as data scientists in the real estate domain. I think it's time for us to wrap up, right? Thank you all for your attention. I uh, hope it was uh, valuable for you. Thank, Thank you, you to my co two Thank you. Great chatting with you guys. Yeah, likewise, as always. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for doing it. Enjoy the conference. Thanks.